tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Please, just take what you want and leave, Callan says. No, I think not, Mr. Evans. I thumbed the chin of my Grim Reaper mask, as if considering the request. My eyes never leave his. A chill spreads over his wife's porcelain face, her eyes snapping wide at the mention of her name. Yes, Laura, I know your husband, and I know you too. She's still a thing of beauty, this asp of a woman, though the years have taken some of the shine off. Her makeup is barely thick enough to smooth the sudden worry lines, wrinkles, sprout out from the corner of her eyes like fledgling bushes. A spray of sunspots drifts from her hands and up her arms. The full cheeks I remember so well have been pared back to sharp angles, chiseled away by time. That or Kellen's lies. Either way, she played a hand in this, and I will show her no pity. No one comes away clean tonight. No one. Not even the boy bound next to her, watching me through brown pools of fear. This child I'd yearned to be. The blood-born son. Who are you? Kellen asks, eyes red-rimmed and swimming with panic. Gabe, is that you? This isn't funny. I lean in close and cut him off leveling my gaze. Think, Mr. Evans, think. Answer for yourself. Who am I? He shrinks back, nearly tipping his chair. I, I, I don't know. Oh, but you do. I settle back in the chair, cross my legs, and keep the gun trained on his chest. Let's play a game to jog your memory. It's simple. I ask a question and you answer. You tell the truth. You lie. It hurts. It hurts worse. Much worse. Got it? Lost for words, he nods, his face taking on a sickly pallor. Good. I tip my head toward his wife. How long? Her forehead creases. How, how long what? Don't play dumb with me, Kellen. How long have you been cheating on her? His mouth droops, lips quick to form their lie, but Laura cuts him off before he can speak. Her voice rings with righteous indignation, her eyes hot on mine. Who the hell do you think you are? I'll have you know my brother's a cop when he finds out about- I swing the gun her way. Not another word. She falls silent, cold shock swimming through her arctic blue irises, her eyes forming mean slits. This is a woman used to giving orders, not taking them. My command has her boiling inside, but it's nothing compared to the rage simmering within me. The rage that's been building for a lifetime. I leave the gun on her and shift my gaze back to Kellen. Back to the thin line of sweat beating beneath his thinning hairline. How long? Kellen shakes his head and fans out his fingers of his zip-tied hands. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a lie. Just last night I followed him to a bar, watched him fish out a college candy brunette, and watched him play grab ass with her. As they piled into his car, then it was off to her place. As they disappeared inside, I imagined him calling Laura, his boxers slung around his ankles, with his eyes rolled back in pleasure. Sorry, honey, I gotta stay late again. Too much work to do. Last chance, I say. Kellen turns to Laura, eyebrows straining up as if... I have no clue what he's talking about. 
I'd pull the stun gun from my jacket pocket and slam it crackling into his leg. His quadriceps contract and seize, and I watch his eyes crystallize with the knowledge that I'm willing to do anything to extract the truth. Whatever it takes. The boy screams, and as I pull it back, only a second this time, Kellen's next lie will get him two. Push it past three, and he'll fade. Take it to five, and he'll be jello. I start back towards his leg, and he cuts me off. Stop! Stop! Okay, okay, Kellen says. Okay? What? I ask. He tips his head toward the floor. Laura turns his way, concern spreading over her face. What is it, Kellen? What's he talking about? He plays the victim, shoulders slumped forward, mouth pulled tight. I... I, I had a fling. Just, just a one-night thing, but it, it was nothing. I was just... I crush the stun gun into the ribs of his corduroy pants. He screams as 50,000 volts surge through his leg for a second time. I take off two seconds and pull it back. Now, now, Mr. Evans. Secrets don't make friends, do they? When was this... Fling. I soak the last word in derision. He now has cold clarity in his mud-colored eyes, searching mine, wondering exactly what I know. Oh, and I know so much more. But we have all night to share, and I'm just getting started. His jaw bunches as he spits the word out. Last night. What? Laura says. What do you mean, last night? I grin beneath my mask as the tide of her anger shifts his way. Good, Mr. Evans. Good. I lean forward in my chair and pat his knee. We're making progress. His brow crunches in wrath. It's a look I remember well. I realize Laura's talking. You tell me right now, Kellen, who is this little... I cut her off with a wave of the gun. Enough. Let's keep playing. How many women have there been? Since her, that is, I say, nodding to Laura. His mouth crumples inward as he chews a hole in his cheek. Two. Only two. Wrong. I jam the stun gun into the side of his neck and squeeze the trigger. His jaw hammers shut as an electric river pours through his veins, through his tendons. I watch them snap beneath the skin as a thin rope of spittle works in the corner of his mouth to his lap. Three seconds. I release the trigger on his head, smacks the back of his chair with a dull thud. He's starting to daze. Laura watches me, silent and doe-eyed, Unable to process what's happening, or who she should hate more, him or me. The answer is him. He lifts his head and gives it a shake. Take two. How many? A whimper to my right. The boy, crimson with fear. His voice trembling. Please don't hurt my daddy anymore. I lock eyes with him. He has the sandy blonde hair of his mother and his father's nose, thin and straight. Beneath the tear tracks, his cheeks a flushed tan, the last remnants of summer. My gaze drops lower, and I see that he's wet his pants. It nearly breaks me. Jacob, does your daddy tell you the truth? The boy sits there lips flamed and quivering. Well, does he? He gives me the slightest nod. Exactly. Telling the truth is the right thing to do. Your daddy's lying. If he tells the truth, I'll stop hurting him. Sound fair? Unsure, the boy nods again, his eyes glazed with tears. I can't look at him any longer. 
I know what he sees when he looks at me. The monster I've become. The monster his father made me. I swing back to Kellen. How many? Six. He says it between clenched teeth, jaw grinding away. Laura keeps her gaze on the gun, but I see her eyes ice over. There it is. The first crack in the veneer. How long have you betrayed your wife? He glowers at me and bucks at the restraints, ready to tear me to shreds with his bare hands. But he won't escape. I've done my research. I bound him well. I let him carry on for a minute before brandishing the stun gun. You done? Scowling, he falls silent. Good. Now, how long? His lips form a grim line. Seven years. Kellen? No. Her features crumble beneath the weight of her husband's confession. Suddenly, she's ten years older. You said you'd never do that to me. You promised. I whirl on her, dumbstruck. And you believed him? You, of all people, actually believed him? She stares at me in silence, hands shaking. Answer me! Who are you? You know who I am. She cocks her slim head, eyes flashing recognition. Connor? Ding, 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 I say, as I rip off the mask and fling it across the room. Oh my god, I thought you were in New York. Kellen whispers. I glare at him, rage burning through my chest like molten lava. Did you think I'd just leave you alone forever, you bastard? Just let you and your family live out the rest of your days in peace after destroying mine? Connor, I... I thrust a finger in his face and cut him off. No, Kellen, no. I listened to your shit for years, and so did my mother, and it ruined her. I never meant for that to happen. Of course you didn't. You just traded up after this one came along, I say with a nod to Laura. She was younger, hotter. I mean, who can blame you, right? It wasn't like that. No? What was it like then, huh? Why'd you abandon us? Why'd you ruin my mother? Connor, you have to believe me. I never knew she'd do that. Bullshit. She told you she would. Over and over she told you. I stop and swallow the rage crawling up my throat. I need to take my time here, make him understand. I lower my voice and lean forward. Do you have any idea the hell I've been through since? The foster homes, the abuse? Can you believe I actually thought you'd come for me? That you'd adopt me? I waited for a year, Kellen. An entire year. Every day I'd look out the window and expect to see you pull up. But you never did. I pause. My eyes are starting to burn with the memory, and I can't go on. But I have to. I have to know. Why didn't you? I was... selfish, Connor. I didn't know what to do with you. I... I... I loved you. I really did. But... After what happened with your mom, I I didn't think you'd want me in your life. I, I guess I just chickened out. I look away and wipe my eyes. See, that's just it. Even after what you did, I still believed in you. I thought you cared for me. Can you believe that? I was such a fool. My voice cracks, and I can no longer hold back, the tears cutting hot across my skin. I stand and turn away and let them fall where they may. My entire body is shaking. 
Then I consider walking out the door for a moment. I can't do this to them any longer. Especially the boy. It will destroy him. Then Laura speaks behind me. Her voice soft. Barely a whisper. Your mom wasn't well, Connor. She needed help. We tried to tell her. We offered to pay, but she wouldn't listen. Fury sparks in my chest, and I whirl around and bring my face within inches of hers. She winces back. Her perfume wafts forward, peaches and cream. I know what you did. She blinks, lips tight, colorless. N no, what? You told her to do it. To kill herself. That no one would miss her. That you wouldn't give him up, no matter what. I never said that. I tried to help her. Connor, I swear it. I- Shut up. Shut up! Don't you lie to me, too. Do you think I never read your emails? Your texts? Well, I did, Laura. Every last one. She showed me all those vile things you said. You never cared about my mother. Don't you dare act like you do now. They watch me with anxious eyes. The three of them, a chorus of dread wondering what I'll do next. The boy is openly sobbing now. His gulping cries are the only sound. I can't bear to look at him. To hear him. I want him gone. Locked, safe in his room. He doesn't deserve any of this. But he has to be here. He has to. It's the only way she'll listen. She'll only see Kellen for who he is. Kellen breaks the silence. Connor, I'm sorry. Truly. I loved your mother. I tried to talk her out of it. Bullshit, I snarl. You left us to rot. No, Kellen. The only thing you've ever loved is yourself. And I think it's time we find out how much. I slowly crack my knuckles, one at a time, as I take in the expanse of the living room of the man who stole my life. The floor to ceiling windows boasting mountain views. Snap! The fringe doors and granite countertops. Snap! The luxurious cream-colored sofas and the opulent fireplace layered in smiling, silver-framed photos of the three of them. Just one big, happy family. Snap! 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 I whip back around. It's time for our final game of the evening. Kellen's face waxes over with fear. I was only ten when you took her. Took everything. I'm sure you'll agree it's only fair I return the favor. But unlike you, I'm a reasonable man. I'll give you something you never gave me. A choice. He's shivering now. This shell of a man. This cancer. How I ever looked up to him, I'll never know. Look, Connor, whatever you're thinking of doing, please don't. My son, he's just a kid. He doesn't need to see this. His words sting. It's true. But it's too late now. I can't turn back. I was just a kid. I thought I was your kid. I hiss through clenched teeth and then take a deep breath and center myself. Here's the game. It's simple. A choice. Your choice, Kellen. You pick one. Your wife, your son, or you. I don't understand. I brandish the gun. Isn't it obvious? My meaning renders his face slack. No. Yes. You can choose. Or I can. 
But either way, someone dies tonight. I stroll over to the boy and, arm trembling, place the barrel against his soft, straw-colored hair. He flinches away, and I feel sick. What have I become? I stare at Kellen. I think I know what makes the most sense. It would be in his best interest. Save him a lot of pain. You know you're just going to screw him up anyway. No. No, you will not hurt my son. Laura screams as she bucks in the chair. A cascade of blue spaghetti veins break out across her neck. I wait for her to stop. I jam the stun gun into her ribs when she doesn't and send crackling agony swimming through her chest. She jerks away and falls silently, a strange purplish tinge over her face. Now, let's be civil about this, I say. No need to lose our heads. The look she gives me as I say it is one of pure, unadulterated fear. To her, I'm unhinged. Crazy. I've finally broken through. Now, maybe she'll listen. I tap her on the nose with the gun. Good. Glad we understand each other. I turn back to Kellen. The name. His face is stained with tears. True emotion. Something I thought impossible. No matter. It's years too late. I wore the mask for a reason. I am the Grim Reaper, and I've come to collect for a lifetime of sin. There's no talking himself out of this one. No silky smooth sentence to win back what he wants. Only a choice. One simple question. Will he sacrifice himself? Will he finally choose someone else? I squat in front of him. You know the right answer here, Callan. You know what you need to do. Say it. He shakes his head. Mouth pulled tight, lips gone. You can't make me do this. Please don't make me do this. Say it. Say your name. You won't feel a thing, which is more than you deserve. Connor... I didn't say it, goddammit! I roar. Say it! Kellen? Laura shrieks beside him. Don't you dare let him hurt our boy. Don't you dare let him hurt my Jacob. My heart tears in my chest at the sight. The boy's complexion has faded to a ghastly white. He won't last much longer. I'm sorry, Jacob. I'm so sorry. Last chance, Kellen. Then I choose. You don't want me to do that. Give me a name. Kellen's head topples forward and lolls side to side. His tears make shining, wet circles on the dark oak floor. Finally, he mumbles something. I lean in. What? He lifts his head, defeat swirling in his eyes. He can't change who he is any more than I can resurrect my mother. I know his answer before he gives it. Laura. You son of a bitch. She hisses. Done, I say, standing and circling behind her. Her hate transforms to fear as I level the glock at the base of her skull. Her entire body tremors as she pleads for her life. She begs me to reconsider that she has a son to live for in frantic tones. That she never meant to hurt me. No, of course not, Laura. I'm sure you didn't. The boy screams for me to leave his mommy alone. His voice mixing with hers and forming an awful cacophony of panic. I let their words rain down. I am titanium. I was forged in the furnace of my youth, smelted with rage and vengeance. All my pity has been ruined by a lifetime of pain and betrayal by those supposed to protect me. To 
to love me. What is love? I cock the gun. Wait, Connor. Kellen, pale-faced and miserable. I wave the gun at him and allow him to speak. I wonder if he will choose someone other than himself for the first time in his life. It chokes out the words. I'm so sorry, Laura. I'm so very sorry. But I, I can't do it. I, I, I can't. Oh, I'll watch over Jacob, I promise. Please, please forgive me. She's crying so hard now she can't respond. Her face is smeared with rage-soaked betrayal. Her mascara running down her face in black streams. She sees him for the first time. She'll never forgive him for this. Say goodbye, Laura. She turns to her son and tells him she loves him through a mess of tears. Says she'll be with him no matter what. Her words lodge in my throat, and my vision blurs to a golden smudge. My mother told me the same thing as she tucked me into bed when she jumped, that she'd always be there, deep down, in my heart. All I had to do was look. God damn you all. I pull the trigger. Her entire body seizes forward as the firing pin clicks home empty. For a moment, she doesn't move, unable to reconcile how she still draws breath. Then, with a sudden jerk, she begins to sob, her shoulders rolling and heaving like the waves of an angry ocean. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. She mumbles into her hands. I lean in and whisper in her ear, now you know who you've married. Now you know what he's capable of. Protect your son. Don't let him become me. Outside, the crisp night air stings my lungs as I walk toward my car. They'll probably call the cops, but I don't care. For the first time in two decades, I can breathe. I can finally let go. I met her on the internet, same way so many people do these days, sitting at the computer in my dad's one bedroom on a Friday night. He was snoring away in the other room, so I knew he had taken his pills. He slept like a rock on those things. Insomnia, he told me, but I knew the real reason he took them. He took them to escape, to leave the world he had created for himself. I also craved the escape, but my escape was video games. At least I wasn't plying myself with drugs. And outside of that, I was trying to change my reality. I knew there was someone else out there. Someone just like me. I was intent on finding her. And soon enough, I would. Dad would never approve of what I was doing. Internet dating, chat rooms, none of that would fly with him. That wasn't his way of doing things. And the way he saw it, his way was the only way. That was the ironic thing. Because the way he turned out, there was no chance I was following in his footsteps. In a sense, I was glad he drugged himself to sleep every night. It was my only chance to do this. I opened the browser and navigated to the dating site. Always with that nervous excitement when I went to check my messages. And when the screen finished loading, that dark, sinking feeling when there weren't any. Not one person interested out of the thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people on here. No one even compelled to tell my ugly ass to get lost. Nothing. Nothing at all. Typical. As usual, I spent a few minutes feeling sorry for myself, considered giving up the same way I always did. But I didn't give up. I took a deep breath and kept browsing for new profiles. It wasn't desperation, but fear that kept me going. My fear was quitting before my time came. Maybe just before my time came. Like walking away from a slot machine before the next guy hit the jackpot. This had to pay out eventually, even if I was the last guy on earth to find someone. Inevitably, the day would come. It was a waiting game. A numbers game. No different than the video games I love so much. 
as long as I kept playing, I was still in the game. Just keep at it, Kevin. There's someone else out there. All you gotta do is be here when she shows up. If you can't manage that, then you might as well be your dad. And I kept at it. It was always the thought of my dad that kept me going. A guy who did everything by the book. Who stayed out of trouble, went to Georgetown University, and earned a master's degree. Only to marry some narcissistic bitch who only cared about herself, mostly because she was as successful as him. And then to have it all fall apart on him. To lose his house, his family, and most of his money. The last thing I wanted was to be like him. Sometime later, while I was scrolling through the profiles in a hundred mile radius, a strange bead of light flitted across the screen. A green number one up by my inbox icon. A message. Someone had sent me a message. In real time. The idea of it was kind of embarrassing, like I wasn't supposed to see it so soon. Whoever had sent this was online this very moment. My mouse hovered over the icon. Should I click it? If I read it immediately, will she know? Would she think I'm a loser who spends his days and nights staring at his inbox? Or some kind of over-eager pervert? I checked my mail settings to see if there was a read-unread indicator for outgoing messages, but there didn't appear to be. Preparing myself for disappointment, I clicked on the mail icon and read the heading. Wanna talk? Read the subject line. The name of the sender was Trixie. I let out the long breath I'd been holding. Trixie. Had to be some kind of troll. Either that or some cam girl peddling her wares. But when I opened the message, it didn't look that way. It said, Kevin, you seem like a nice guy in your profile. Would you like to chat? If you do, please let me know. Trixie. I read the message several times over. I liked the part where she called me a nice guy. Mostly because I knew that was all I had to offer. If she had called me hot or sexy, I'd have known it was fake. But there was none of that. Nothing suggestive. No link to some weird streaming site. She seemed like a normal girl. Just some girl who wanted to chat. Maybe he's someone just like me. Suddenly, I was less concerned with seeming overeager than I was with losing the chance to take her up on it. I hit reply, wrote, Trixie, i definitely like to chat. Thanks for reaching out. I'll be hanging around tonight, so hit me back if you're around. Kevin. I looked over the message, ultimately deleted the word definitely, and hit send. My heart was beating harder than normal. Had I acted impulsively? Maybe so. But a guy like me couldn't afford to miss any opportunities. Even Dad had cautioned me to keep my eyes open for opportunities. Although he had never approve of this one, the lesson still resonated. Sitting back in my chair and staring at my inbox notifications, it occurred to me I should check her profile. Bracing myself again for disappointment, I finally got up the courage to click on her icon. Trixie, age 18, appearance, white, slim-figured, brown hair, interests, reading, gaming, hanging with friends, seeking, nice, unselfish guy around my age. There was a picture of her, a kind of girl next door look, not unattractive, not exactly a bombshell. No complaints from me. I'd been called ugly enough to learn to be realistic. I hadn't even bothered to post my best photo for my profile pic. Why raise anyone's expectations? However this thing panned out, I'd rather she be pleasantly surprised when we met. Or at least not unpleasantly surprised. I can be naive at times, but I'm not unrealistic. I'm no catch. Nice, unselfish, sure. But that's about all I brought to the table. After rereading Trixie's profile, my inbox lit up again. Again, with that lightheaded feeling, I clicked the icon, grinding my teeth at the sluggish connection. When the window finally loaded, I saw Trixie had replied. Hi, Kevin. So happy to meet you. I look forward to learning more about you, but could we chat somewhere else? Sending mail back and forth is totally awkward. I put a link below to a special chat site I use. If you could meet me there? My username is Trixie628. I'll be waiting. Trixie. My heart sunk at the mention of the external link, 
This was just what the cam girls did. Solicit you at a legitimate place, then drag you to whatever site they were affiliated with to set up an account and start sending them money. Then again, none of those girls used such plain pictures for their profile photos. Aside from the fact that she wanted to chat somewhere else, there wasn't much to be suspicious of. Should I give it a chance? Who was I kidding? Of course I would. I highlighted the address in the hyperlink, a long bizarre domain name that didn't make any sense in some mile-long subdirectory. Suspicious by anyone's standards, but at that moment I didn't care if it blew up the computer. First, I got up to make sure my dad was still asleep. Then I opened up a private browser window and pasted it in. The browser worked for a minute, but then returned with the message, Domain doesn't appear to exist. My heart sunk. I repasted the link again, but got the same message. Damn it! Trixie must have messed it up when she sent it to me. I brought up the window with her mail, was ready to reply to her message when I clicked the actual link she had sent me. A new browser window popped up, but instead of the not found message, it appeared to be connecting. I waited. To my surprise, a site began to load, a plain black background. When the page was fully rendered, it was hardly passable for a website. Just a plain black screen and a search box. That was all. Whatever this site was, it looked nothing like a flashy cam site. No ads, no sign up button, no donate button. Nothing at all that suggested paying. That was comforting in a way, a little discomforting in another. In my experience, nothing online was there to just be helpful. If this was some kind of chat site, you'd at least expect an advertisement or two. Without any way to take your money, you have to wonder what else this place is trying to take from you. Where to start? I typed Trixie's name into the search box and hit enter. The site worked for a minute, then came up with the message, User Trixie628 is online, and a small window opened up. I saw our names in the window. Kevin, Trixie628. Kevin? Did I even type my name anywhere? Had to be something in that link she sent me. Some kind of token, maybe? But I barely had time to consider it before the message came through. Hi, Kevin. I'm so glad you came. Hi, Trixie. Thanks for inviting me. I've never heard of this place before. My connection isn't too good. It's the only site I can really chat on. Where are you from? I asked. You said you're in Orange Oaks, right? I'm from Summit, not far. Yes, Orange Oaks. Your connection is bad over there? That surprised me. Summit was a nice area, not the type of place you'd imagine having crappy internet access. Yeah, it's slow where I am. I read that you like gaming. Me too. Which games? The conversation was smooth and easy, no long pauses between replies. I told her my hope for the future, to become a video game tester for one of my favorite game developers. Not at all the big, lucrative game plan most girls want to hear from a prospective companion, but she thought it was cool. And before I knew it, it was past two in the morning. It turned out Trixie and I had a lot in common. She was an outcast in school, same as me. A bit of a weirdo, maybe, but a weirdo gamer girl was exactly what I needed. It was still early to tell, but it seemed like we were hitting it off. It's getting pretty late, she wrote. It is. Can we talk again tomorrow? Sure. How's it like nine o'clock your time? My time, I wrote. Aren't you in Summit? JK, she said. LOL. Anyway, how about like ten? My dad's kind of a jerk about stuff like this. He's usually passed out by ten, though. That sucks, she wrote. Ten is cool, though. Cool. I'll be on at ten. Good night. I'm glad we met. Me too, I wrote. Good night. I checked the clock. It was 2.30 a.m. I desperately had to get to bed or I'd be passing out in class tomorrow. But I wasn't tired at all. I was so excited. I didn't think I'd ever fall asleep. All that waiting. All that hoping that eventually, if I just kept trying, I'd eventually meet someone. Was it possible we were meant to meet like this? I erased my browser history and got in bed by 3 o'clock. Eventually, I did manage to fall asleep, 
and for once, my dreams were happy ones. And when the alarm went off a couple hours later, I woke up like I had slept a full night. Even the bullies at school couldn't ruin my mood today. Had I fallen in love? It was a crazy idea, I know. I'd only just met her. Not even met her, really. I didn't even know what her voice sounded like. But something had happened, something different. I might be naive at times, and I guess I was a little desperate, but I couldn't downplay this, not even to myself. I couldn't help but be excited, and I didn't want to help it. After all the waiting, after all the nothing, I deserved it. School felt like a snake pit to me. It always had, and it still did, even now my last year. I barely knew what the place looked like, always with my face pointed at the floor. All around me, people talking to each other like they belong there. Normal people, I guess, but still. There was always something weird to me about that. I'd always wondered what things would be like if I showed up today for the first time. I had had 18 years in Orange Oaks to establish myself as an outcast, but if I started fresh one day, just showed up and tried to fit in, would I be able to fake it? Would Callahan and his cronies still torture me in gym class? Would the groups of girls still snicker behind their locker doors when I shuffled past? A snake pit. A snake pit I had no choice but to hazard nearly every day of my life. I was in the locker room getting changed into my t-shirt and shorts. I'd been focusing on Trixie all day, and I was trying not to let gym class spoil my unusually good mood. Still, I could sense the malevolent forces behind me. Ignore them, I told myself. They don't matter. Good things are happening. A shoe hit the back of my head, leaving my ears ringing. Oh, excuse me, buddy. Shoe got away from me. Could you toss me that? Good things are happening, I repeated to myself. There was nothing in this school, nothing in this dimension that could touch me. Not now, because by ten tonight... I'd be in my own dimension, talking to Trixie. I picked up the shoe and turned around to face Callahan and his followers. But before I could toss it back, the next shoe hit me in the face. By 9 o'clock that night, I was playing Oblivion, but I couldn't focus on what I was doing. I was worried my dad wouldn't pass out on time for me to log in. But when he tapped me on the shoulder and I saw the glazed over look in his eyes, I knew he was close to going to bed. Kevin, he said, I know I don't talk to you a whole lot these days, and I'm sorry about that. Just going through a bit of a rough patch, you know? Hey, what happened to your eye? Nothing. Slipped. How's school been? All right. Grades good? Yeah, I said. That much was true. The only thing perfect about me was my grades. Not that I cared much. It was all just effortless. He sighed, pulled a chair from the table, and sat down heavily. I realize I haven't been a whole lot of help lately, Kevin, and again, I'm sorry, but let me just tell you this. Remember this, and everything will end up okay. All right, Kevin? All right, Dad. What is it? Just keep your eye on the prize, Kev. I know things are uneventful right now, but you'll get into college will get you into a good field where you can find a good job. I don't want to go to college, Dad. We've been through this. You're smart. You'll make good money. Everything will be different. Everything will be better. You just got to set yourself up. Set yourself up for success. You understand, buddy? Oh, I understood. We had had this same conversation a million times since Mom left. I wasn't about to argue with him especially in his condition. It would only get him aggravated and keep him awake longer. But how was I supposed to take him seriously? A guy who wanted for me everything I hated. To live a conventional, successful life. To wear a suit and tie to work every day and pick up my dry cleaning on the way home. And look where all that had gotten him. I understand, Dad. He cleared his throat and patted me on the shoulder. Good, I think that about does it for me. I'll see you tomorrow, all right, buddy? All right, good night, Dad. Good night, buddy. 
Dad shuffled off to the bedroom, as always, trying to walk as soberly as possible and failing miserably. There was nothing sober about him, not in mind or body. I knew he wanted the best for me, but the fact was he had never known what was best for himself. If it were up to him, I wouldn't do a thing but work until I graduated college. Maybe it seemed like a good idea on paper, but people aren't made of paper. I was a living, breathing person. I was suffering in school. I was starving in this little apartment, and chatting with Trixie the night before had only kindled my appetite. I wasn't going to college. All I wanted was to find someone else like me. My heart wasn't made of paper, and the heart wants what it wants. Maybe Dad's did too, but his heart wasn't anything like mine. I waited patiently for Dad to start sawing wood in the other room. It didn't take long. I had to reload the dating site to get that weird link again, but I had lost all interest in the site itself and closed it as soon as the chat site started loading. I was a little early, but was ecstatic to see Trixie was already logged on. She had been waiting for me. Hi, Kevin. Hey, Trixie. I thought my dad would never get to bed. LOL. Did you get any sleep last night? A little. How about you? There was a little pause, then eventually she replied. Not really. I'm pretty tired. Tired of everything. I told her I'd be sure not to keep her up all night again, and she agreed. There was always tomorrow, after all. Why rush things? We chatted casually for a little while, but as the night went on and the moon shone brighter in the window, our conversation took on a kind of gravity. I had stayed away from asking Trixie about her home life. It seemed better to let those things come out on their own. I got the idea she wanted to discuss some of those things, but maybe she wasn't ready. I just want to get out of here, she wrote. Go somewhere else. Somewhere nice. It hurt me in a way that she was saying those things. Wasn't it perfect, after all, that we had met this way, only a couple of towns apart? What if we were soulmates? How could she already be thinking about leaving? Well, don't leave just yet. We haven't even met. I'm just dreaming, she wrote. I'm looking forward to meeting you. When do you think we can? I asked. Soon. As soon as possible. Really? I'm totally cool with that. I mean, when can we meet? Neither one of us had a car. I'd have to get a ride somehow. I wondered what I would wear. All my clothes were garbage. My skin was a mess too. I wondered if I started tonight how many acne treatments it would take to get cleared up in time. It took longer than usual for her to reply, but when she did, it was a longer than usual message. I really want to meet you, Kevin. I really like you. I hope that's not too forward of me to say, but I feel like I can be totally honest with you. I've never felt that way about anyone before. The message made my stomach feel funny. It wasn't too forward at all. I felt the same way she did. She could tell me anything. I really like you too, I wrote. We should meet as soon as possible. Wherever you want, I'll get there, even if it kills me. Another pause. Finally, she wrote, I have to tell you something, Kevin, and I'm worried that when I tell you, you'll change your mind. I promise that if you do, I won't blame you. I just really hope you don't. I'm scared, Kevin, because I've never felt so connected to anyone before. And after I tell you what I need to tell you, you may never want to talk to me again. Impossible. The possibilities ran through my mind. Was she crippled? Missing a leg? Deaf? Blind? But I wasn't a superficial person. No matter what I thought of, the answer was still yes. I most definitely wanted to meet her. Don't worry, I wrote. I feel the same way you do, Trixie. You can tell me anything. A longer pause this time. Finally, the reply came. I don't want to scare you off, Kevin. I'm not in Summit anymore. I'm in another place now. It's a different place. And in order for us to meet, you have to come to this place too. Well, where is it? I wrote. I'm sure I can get there somehow. This was the longest pause but my eyes didn't leave the screen while I waited. I died in Summit, Kevin. Now I'm somewhere else, and in order for you to meet me, you have to be dead too. 
I could barely keep my eyes open at school the next day. Besides a couple of the bullies though, no one really noticed. That was the story of my life, really. Most of the time, I felt like the invisible boy. In my favorite RPG video games, you always had a number of skill points you could distribute to choose your character's best attributes. Strength, charisma, dexterity, endurance, etc, etc. I always put a lot of skill points into charisma. It helped you interact with other characters to affect better outcomes. In real life, it seemed like my charisma was permanently stuck on zero. No one noticed me, and when they did, it was never a positive response. The bullies only stopped teasing me when they got bored of it. Even my teachers couldn't help but yawn when I asked them questions. If I had any high attribute at all, it was the ability to slip through life without being noticed. Stealth, but not the roguish stealth you used to your advantage in video games. My stealth was dullness. And because of that, I'd only been noticed by one girl over my entire high school career, a supposedly dead girl from Summit. It was also because of that I was able to sneak out of gym class without being caught. I was also able to sneak into the library to do some research in the newspaper database. It wasn't long before I found what I was looking for. At the sight of the name in print, my stomach nodded. Trixie Williams, 18 of Summit, was discovered dead on Sunday morning by her parents, Sue and Andrew Williams. Trixie suffered from depression, her parents explained to police, although she had showed no sign of suicidal thoughts or behavior prior to the incident. She actually seemed really happy the past few days, Andrew explained. It was the last thing we expected. Trixie was a talented artist and hoped to work in video game design. She enjoyed painting, playing the guitar, and playing video games. Services will be held at Summit Memorial Home this Friday, February 26. The date of the paper was 2017, three years ago. Trixie still claimed to be 18 years old. I just sat there for a while, staring at the article and trying to process the information. This had to be some kind of prank, some sadistic weirdo trying to get me to kill myself. But why would anyone want to do that? To create a profile? To stay up until 2 in the morning trying to convince the most inconsequential human alive to commit suicide? It didn't make any sense. I checked to make sure no one was around and opened up a new window to sign on to the dating site. I accessed my messages and hit the link. The browser worked for a while, then returned the familiar message. The domain doesn't appear to exist. I tried again, but got the same result. I put the domain in the search engine and scrolled through pages and pages of supposed matches, but not one pertinent result showed up. The link only worked on my home computer, almost like the site was intended just for me. Some kind of dark web thing? But no, you needed a special browser for that. Internet Explorer didn't make the grade. It was more than that. It was surreal. That was a word for it. Surreal. I checked my watch. 20 minutes until I needed to be at my next class. There was a feeling in my stomach like I was starting to get sick. Was this Trixie thing some kind of sadistic prank using unheard of technology? Or was it real? There were only two possibilities, I decided. It was fake, or it was surreal. And if it was surreal, and if it was surreal, did that disqualify it from being real? Trixie Williams, 18 of Summit. The girl was real. At least she was in 2017. My feelings were real. If she wasn't real, then why couldn't I let her go? Like winning the lottery and giving all the money away. Giving up these feelings would leave me in a worse place than I was before. I couldn't, I knew. I wouldn't. It was all I had right now. The heart wants what it wants. I was playing video games at home, always keeping an eye on the clock. 9 p.m. Every 20 minutes or so, my dad would come out of the bedroom and shuffle into the kitchen. He'd take the bottle off the top of the refrigerator and fill his glass open the freezer and drop in a couple of ice cubes. Then he'd retreat to the bedroom and disappear for a while. Sometimes he'd hit me with some fatherly platitude on the way out like, you do your homework, buddy? And I'd tell him, yes, dad. And he'd nod and that would be that. 
but tonight he paused by his door and walked back to the living room. I could sense him standing behind me. Got some news for you, buddy, he said. I paused the game and turned to face him. Look, I know you've got your own ideas about things, but I want you to know I only want the best for you. You know that, don't you, buddy? What is it, Dad? Look, I went ahead and applied you to Georgetown University, just like your old dad. And you know what? You got accepted. The smile he put on was like a car salesman trying to unload a junk car. He knew just what I thought of that, and the idea that he thought he could sell it with a smile made me that much more angry. We've been through this, Dad. I'm not like you. I'm not going to college. That's ridiculous, buddy. You're smart enough to know that. I'm smart enough to know I don't want to do things your way. I'll be just fine. I'll figure something out. It's been figured out, Kevin. There's a way to do things. There's a recipe for success, and it's been figured out for a long time. You go to a good college, you get a good degree, and then you're successful. And that's what I want for you. You want me to be successful? Like you, Dad? The implication was obvious, and I could tell that it stung him. Listen to me. I'm not going to try and tell you I did everything right in my life. No one does, okay? But a lot of stuff I got right, and I need you to get those things right too. Look at yourself. Look at where those right things got you. You think I want to be anything like that? You think I want to be anything like you? You are a lot like me, Kevin. You've got the smarts. You've got what it takes. But here's some news for you if you don't know it. You need money to live a good life, and you're not going to make that kind of money playing video games and sitting around not having a plan. Maybe I've got a plan, Dad, and maybe that plan doesn't include fucking college. You're going. I'm not going, and I'm sure as hell not going to go where you went. What the hell do you care anyway? Is it that important that I end up like you did? To marry some psychopath who fucks up my life and leaves? I want you to have choices. Not to make all the choices I made, but to have those choices. He shook his head like he was hoping to fit his thoughts together. Let me level with you, Kevin. You're not going to build a life by chance. You're not going to catch some great stroke of luck. And it hurts me to say it, but you're not going to get by on your looks. You've got brains, Kevin. That's what you've got. And God knows why you don't want to use them, but... I threw my video game controller at the wall. It left a dent in the sheetrock and landed on the floor in pieces. He glared at me, wide-eyed and speechless. Fuck you, Dad. Fuck your college and fuck your success. You're a loser. And maybe I'll be a loser too, but I'll never be a loser like you. My dad couldn't speak. He just stood there smelling like booze and sweat, not knowing what to say. My eyes never left his. Finally, he turned and shuffled back to his bedroom. You're going, he said quietly. If not to Georgetown, then somewhere else. Not here. He went into the bedroom and slammed the door behind him. Then it was quiet. Very quiet. It was still quiet at 9.30 and he hadn't come out for another drink. At 9.45, I put my ear to the bedroom door and heard him snoring. He had made his escape early tonight. I was free. And only then had I settled down enough to think about what he had said. I was going, he had said. Georgetown or somewhere else. Not here. He was going to kick me out. He couldn't force me to go back to school, but he could force me out on my own. So I was going to have to come up with some plan after all. And what would that entail? Some shitty retail job with barely enough money to get by? Wasn't that exactly what he hoped for me to avoid? I needed some time. A new set of armor. A better loadout. I wasn't ready yet. Damn it. I sat at the computer and pulled up the weird link, clicked it. Trixie wasn't on yet. No messages in my inbox. Damn, did I need to talk to someone. Every second that went by felt like an hour. And something else occurred to me then. 
How would I talk to Trixie if Dad kicked me out? This only worked on this computer, only in this apartment. Would I lose her too, along with everything else? Damn! I brought my fist down on the desk, then cursed myself for making noise. It didn't matter, Dad was still snoring. Drugged up prick. He was no different than Callahan and his goons at school, doing his best to make me miserable. I could only imagine what they had in store for me at Georgetown. Four more years of hell, a gilded sheet of paper, a first-class ticket to a life of misery. I could hear it right now. I'm sorry, Mr. Gardner, but don't you think you're a bit overqualified for this position? I mean, a degree in finance from Georgetown University? Why would a guy like you want to settle for four walls and a PlayStation? I clenched my fists but resisted the urge to pound the desk again. It was 9.55. Still no Trixie. I turned my chair to face the wall, still with the empty inbox icon burned onto my retinas. I took a deep breath and considered things. Maybe I was overreacting about college. Maybe this was my chance to do what I'd always fantasized about, to show up somewhere completely different, to redistribute my attribute points, to start fresh like a whole new character. But how long would I be able to pull that off? How long before I became an outcast again? Started walking the halls with my eyes glued to the floor and the girls cackling as I shuffled by. And add to that, no way to chat with Trixie anymore. Not only would we never meet, but we'd be cut off completely. And while I rotted away at college, she'd be rotting away wherever she was. She seemed so lonely just as lonely as me. And eventually she'd find someone else, someone with the determination to actually meet her, and I'd be heading to work in my suit and tie and picking up my dry cleaning on the way home to my empty apartment, and sitting on my computer scrolling through profiles and watching my empty mailbox while no one replied. No one, because I missed my shot. I walked away from the slot machine and the next guy pulled the winning lever because I missed my jackpot and it was the last chance I'd ever get. And I'd... My heart was racing. I turned back to the computer. The light from the screen had taken on a blue glow too bright to look at. I stood up on weak and wobbly legs and slid the chair away. I walked down the hall to my dad's bedroom and slowly pushed the door open. He was snoring. I walked around the bed and picked up the little orange bottle on the end table and left the room. In the kitchen, I poured out the contents of the bottle and counted the little oblong pills. Twenty-four of them. Harmless, innocuous little things they seemed, but not all at once they weren't. I took Dad's bottle off the top of the refrigerator and unscrewed the cap. I took three or four pills at a time, chased them down with the booze until they were gone. My heart wasn't racing anymore, but my arms and legs were still weak and wobbly. It occurred to me that I ought to wipe my history and turn off the computer, but on the heels of that, I knew it didn't really matter. I could feel the alcohol soaking into my bloodstream and brought back a memory from my childhood when I'd snuck a beer from my dad at a barbecue. That warm, relaxed feeling like everything was suddenly right with the world. It felt odd to me back then, but tonight, it was exactly what I needed. And unlike then, this time... I didn't want to go back, and I wouldn't have to. I was going, not to Georgetown, but not here. I sat where I was for a minute, my flesh oozing between the slats of the wooden kitchen chair. Eventually, I forced myself to my feet and back to the computer. My arm felt weighed down, and the mouse felt glued to the desk. I didn't know if Trixie was still online, but I knew she would get my message. In the text field, I typed, Trixie. I'm coming. Trixie's not here. Then again, neither am I. They carried out my body earlier this morning. I was lying prone on the floor next to the computer, still with the strange sight open on the desktop. Even then, I was watching, waiting for Trixie's reply. But the moment my dad thought to look at it, the browser crashed and shut down on its own. It was for my eyes only. I know intuitively that I'm stuck here, the same way I'd be if I'd jumped off a moving train somewhere. Dad's back in bed, performing his famous disappearing act. No pills this time. That's my fault, I guess. 
Maybe the whole thing is my fault. I wonder if he'll come to join me one day. Maybe the two of us share the same destiny after all. The browser reopens as I stand in front of the computer, the strange address refreshing in the URL field. The site opens and there's the plain black screen and thread of messages. Trixie is typing. I'm sorry, she says. Sorry? For what? What has she got me into? I reach for the keyboard, but my fingers find no purchase. And how is she typing? There has to be some kind of trick to this. It's like a video game when you think about it. Maybe I'm stuck now, but I've got all the time in the world to figure it out. It's a waiting game. A numbers game. As long as I keep playing, I'm still in the game. I'm not going to Georgetown, that much I know. Whether I'm going anywhere else is left to be seen. Things don't always turn out the way you expect them to. My dad could tell you that. But hope persists, even beyond the persistence of the flesh. It's the antidote to the tortured soul. Without torture, I wonder if hope would even exist. Trixie has logged out. She probably knows I can't reply. Not yet. But Trixie and I are the same now. I'll figure this out. There's got to be some bug, some exploit in this game. And who better to find it than me? I'll find it by God. I'll find it. I'll find it. When I was 11 and my brother Rourke was 16, Dad moved us to the jungle to deliver the Lord's good word to the people who lived there. He must have thought it would change us, make us into men, lift us above the everyday sins of the other boys littering the stoops of Boston. That's what he called them, everyday sins. Dad said that everyday sins were small things. Small things like not telling the Irish girl who lives in the building across the way that maybe the cat's been sitting in her window, because the way her curtains fall lately they bunch up around the pull string. And if a person were bending down in just the right way, for example, on his knees, whispering prayers before bed, he might see right through the gap to whomever might be standing there, blow-drying her hair, in clean white panties. Everyday sins can sneak up on you, son. Like bees. One or two aren't so bad, but when you get a swarm of them together, you're in big trouble. Dad had black hair and a mouth that could smile all the way to the corners of his eyes. He was not a religious fanatic or a child abuser, if that's what you're thinking. Dad never beat us with Bibles or locked us in closets or forced us to grasp crucifixes heated over burners. He was just an electrician turned preacher who, in addition to being fond of analogies, believed that God would want men and boys to wear heeled shoes and pressed shirts while they were delivering the good news. He'd been flipping a batch of Dad's famous hotcakes while he delivered the analogy about the bees. Dad cooked us hot meals all the time, and everything he made was famous. They'll sting you swollen, son, if you give them a chance. You have to be on the lookout. He put the plate of hotcakes on the table and we ate them together in the warm kitchen with syrup and butter and cold milk. There were no bees in the jungle. The native women were not like the Irish girl or the lady with the tiny waist on the detergent box. Their breasts fell to their navels like cupfuls of cold molasses sinking slowly down their chests. They were the first breasts I'd ever seen up close. Instead of using a toilet, the villagers squatted over holes and their nails were thick and yellow. They were all missing a toenail or a fingernail, and sometimes more than one. The girls poked pieces of wood and bone through holes in their noses and ears, and sometimes lumps of scar tissue bloomed up around the holes like chunks of white lime built up around our drain at home. They squatted next to coal beds while they cooked. Some nights the firelight showed me their down there hair and dark parts beneath that hung like flaps. Some had brown and black tattoos on their faces. Some of their heads were as bald as eggs. The men were strong and glossy and hard. They hunted monkeys and butchered them with their hands. Then they cooked up the meat, and the guts too, 
They even broke open the bones and dug inside with their thumbs and then ate the stuff that came out. Sometimes they pulled out the guts before the monkey even stopped breathing. The children turned over logs and found white grubs the size of pecans that they roasted on sticks before chewing them up. They watched the moon and some nights they smeared things on themselves and danced in front of bonfires. One night, I saw a baby born. Inside our chapel was very, very hot. The walls and roof were made of heavy pine planks. The planks were the first things we brought in once the road was cleared, said Father Clausen, showing us how to fan out mosquito nets over our beds and weight them at the bottom. He pointed to the four glass windows, looking very proud. From a pair of very charitable Christians in Long Island, real glass, they let the light of Christ shine right in. He beamed. I doubt there's another set of glass windows for 300 miles in any direction. The windows didn't open. The air in the chapel was as hot and heavy as the steam that used to hiss from Dad's iron. Beads of sap oozed from the pine lumber, scenting the smother like Christmas time. Everything was sticky. The few villagers curious enough to attend services brought banana leaves to sit on so they wouldn't get sap on their bottoms from sitting in the pews. They fanned themselves with fronds, and then stopped coming altogether. Dad said sometimes the good word was like the sound of the ocean. Waves just keep crashing on in the background, and finally a day comes when people see that the waters are cool and clear. People wade in and try to swim. Some of those people will take to the water like fish and others might not get the hang of it right away. Some people might only dip in a toe. He'd always drop his voice for the next part. And some people need us more than anyone else, because by the time they get to the water, they've already been on fire for a long, long time. Dad was from Chicago first, then Minneapolis, and then Boston. He'd signed a year contract for us, and when the review board asked if he'd had any experience living in the tropical wild, he said, I've studied up. To us, he said, If the Swiss family Robinson can do it, so can we. The Lord will watch over us. But not many days had passed before it became clear that neither thing was true. We were dangerously ignorant about the jungle. We packed useless things, a swimsuit, a gold pocket watch, a red plastic radio that never picked up a station and ran out of batteries after the first week. Dad bought three jars of pomade because he was afraid he'd run out. Nonetheless, he assured us everything would be okay. We were on the Lord's mission, and he was looking out for us. Those first months were a dark time. Our water filter was a heavy contraption that took both hands and all my weight to pump it. In the heat of the day, I'd avoid pumping water until I was so thirsty my head throbbed, and then make it worse by exerting myself in the heat. For food, we had a kind of dried porridge with vitamins ground up in it, and you added water to make a sweet, gritty sludge. The best way to get it down was to drink it fast, like cod liver oil. Suffering in button-up shirts and heeled shoes with socks, we doled out litanies to the strange natives who looked at us skeptically, clucking their tongues and shaking their heads. The village children ran naked in the open air, and we waded into the brown running stream to splash their dark bodies with water. I tried not to feel bitter thoughts toward them. On Sundays, Dad offered sacrament pressing wafers of host into rough brown hands and making the sign of the cross in the air. On the night in which he was betrayed, Christ broke bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The villagers inspected the paperish discs, taking wary nibbles as if tasting an unfamiliar fruit for the first time without knowing if the flesh would send them into fits or cause chaos in their bowels. Nobody understood a word either side was saying. At night, Rourke and I lay beneath the mosquito nets and felt things crawling on us. 
scratching furrows in our legs with our grimy fingernails. We'd been itchy and paranoid since the night Rourke had found a millipede as long as his forearm coiled inside his pillowcase. Sometimes we lay in bed and remembered things together, like the icebox back in Boston and the cool fountain in the square. Rory reminded me of Dad's famous potato and fried egg hash with ketchup, and I reminded him of Dad's famous chocolate egg cream, always with an extra sprinkle of Ovaltine on top. One very dark night I dreamed of the Irish girl. She was blow-drying her hair. She turned around and I saw that her breasts were deformed and made of scar tissue. Lumps stacked upon lumps like bunches of half-dried grapes. Beneath her white panties something bulged and squirmed. The hard, horny head of a giant millipede emerged from one leg of her panties and wound down the inside of her thigh, circling once before disappearing behind her knee. She held up her thumb, and there was black stuff on it. She sucked it off and smiled looking right at me, still holding the blow dryer. I'd wet the bed that night for the first time in years, but Rory didn't notice. The sheets were always damp anyway, and we trained our noses not to smell things. Four months passed and Dad was sick. He would stand in the palmettos behind the chapel and make himself vomit before morning service, so he wouldn't have to stop the sermon when he felt it coming. Long, flat worms like ribbons came up in the vomit. Yellow stains bloomed in the armpits of his white shirts, and he had to go to the bathroom a lot. He grew thin and grim. Still, he didn't want to leave. He said that nothing was more transient than flesh, and he felt proud that God believed he was strong enough to be tested. Rory and I wondered about this, we also wondered whether or not God considered all meat to be flesh. Were the worms made of flesh? Were the grubs? The millipede? The monkey guts? Were the villagers? What was the difference between flesh and just regular old meat? We couldn't decide. The infection began with a black dot the size of a pea on the top of Dad's foot. It looked like the time I'd stepped on a sharpened pencil and a smooth pellet of lead had lodged itself in the web of my big toe. At first it only itched. Dad thought it might be a mosquito bite turned blood blister. Maybe he could just coax out a few drops of blood and the thing would turn back into regular skin. He squeezed it between his thumbnails, but nothing came out. When it was bigger the next day, he tried to prick it with the corner of his folding razor. The blade barely brushed the dot when Dad sucked air over his teeth and squeezed his eyes shut. Gripping the sides of his foot with both hands as if curling up that way would make the pain stop. The next day, the dot was twice as big, and it was no longer a dot. It was a little brown crater with a black pit and the ring of skin around the crater was puffy and angry looking. The day after that, the foot was so swollen it bulged out of Dad's shoe like rising bread. And a day after that, the shoe didn't fit at all. For the first time in months, Dad stayed in his bed beneath the mosquito net instead of rising from morning prayer. We tried to cool him by fanning him with fronds the way the villagers did, we pumped the water filter for him and offered him mangoes and porridge. He drank some water and ate a little of the mango, but the porridge came right back up. When he could no longer bear the heat in the chapel, he crawled outside to lie on the ground in the shade of the giant palmettos. His hair hung in greasy strings and his forehead was shiny with oil and sweat. The whites of his eyes had begun to look yellowish. He was embarrassed that he'd had to crawl. Two days later, Dad didn't even think about crawling. 
All day long he lay moaning under the palm meadows with the mosquito net draped over him, not caring about the ants that marched across his belly, with a centipede making paths through his hair. He kept one hand pressed into his face, either palm down covering his eyes or palm out with the back of it pressing into his mouth. I think he did that so no more pain sounds would come out. Dad hadn't taken off his sock. He couldn't. The rapid swelling had cinched the seam of elastic tightly around his calf. Flesh bulged above and below the seam, making Dad's lower leg look like a tied sausage. We could have cut the sock off. Despite our ill preparedness in other areas, we managed to bring a pocket knife apiece. Rourke's even had a tiny pair of scissors that folded out, so you could pinch them open and closed with your thumb and forefinger. But Dad wouldn't let us touch his sock. I think he was afraid to see what was happening under there. He didn't want Rory and me to see either, but we knew it was worse than we could imagine because by then... The smell was so bad. Dad's infected leg gave off a smell like fetid cheese and rotten hamburger meat. You could smell it ten feet away. We'd all done a fine job of training our noses to ignore our own smelly underarms and the bouquet of the latrine hole, but no sane person could ever shut out the smell of Dad's infected leg. My brother and I stole sips of air through our mouths and pretended we didn't notice as we sat with Dad, distracting him with staged arguments about which of his sermons we remembered best. He distracted us with forced chuckles that doubled him over with pain. Dad's moans became high and shrill at the end. Consumed, none of us ate or slept. Rory and I didn't know what was expected of us and Dad was too sick to say. God was nowhere to be found. After Dad slipped into delirium, he could no longer refuse Rourke's pleas to let him run and fetch Father Clausen. Rory left the chapel early in the morning, disappearing into the spots of brush that had grown over the path since we'd walked at last. He didn't come back until nearly dawn. Father Clausen will be here when the sun comes up. He'll bring some men with a cart and a mule to bring Dad out. I lifted the mosquito net so Rory could climb into bed next to me. What about the doctor? I whispered. There isn't one. Rory groaned softly as he settled into the bed. He sounded very tired. Not a real one. Dad'll have to be flown out the way we came in. Father Clausen already radioed San Tomas for a pilot. Rory was silent for a while. I told... Father Clausen about about the smell he asked me how long and I told him almost a week after another pause Rory added quietly he asked me if we have kin in Boston you, you know just in, in in case that Rory broke off in a heave I could tell he wanted to cry at last, he said, In case the Lord takes Dad before we make it out of here. He said that in an even, weighted voice I'd never heard from Rourke before. Dad was right about one thing. The jungle had made a man out of my brother. A Presbyterian doctor in San Tomas cut off Dad's pants with scissors that were bent flat halfway down so they could slide right between Dad's pants and his legs. Then, the doctor used his bent scissors to cut Dad's socks into squares. When he began to peel away the squares, Dad tore at his sheets and screamed to God for the strength to stand it until the nurse rushed in with more morphine. Father Clausen stood by his bed and Rory and I held Dad's hands as each square was peeled away. His leg didn't look like a leg anymore. The knee was a black bulge with hard, raised bruises. 
and the gaps between bruises were mounds of flesh so swollen that the skin over them was stretched white and split into hard, bloodless cracks. Below the knee, the bruises became a forest of brown craters, each with a black pit like the first one we'd seen on the top of Dad's foot, the one he thought might be a mosquito bite. Square by square, the infection only grew more grotesque. Ripe pustules on the calf broke audibly to drip green fluid that filled the room with its cheesy, sickening smell. Around the ankles, thick, white, and yellow stuff pooled between chunks of diseased tissue. The foot was nothing more than a spongy, grayish mass, like a wet biscuit dissolving in mop water. A lot of the squares wouldn't peel off. They were melded to the leg with crumbles of yellow crust, and trying to peel them just caused more flesh to tear away exposing Dad's long, white leg bone. The doctor called the squares of stuck sock grafted and said that it probably happened at the very beginning before Dad's body stopped trying to scab over and heal itself. The doctor gave up trying to remove the remaining squares of sock. Even he looked aghast. I've never seen anything like it, he kept saying. His accent sounded like the man with the hot dog cart back home. I've never seen anything like it. Father Clausen took us into a waiting room and swallowed an aspirin and told us that the grafted squares of sock didn't matter anyway. I'm not a doctor, he said, but if I've ever seen a clear-cut case for amputation... It was lying in front of me ten minutes ago. Father Clausen sank into a chair and looked at my brother and I, thin and filthy, blotchy with heat rash and covered with the scabs of bug bites scratched bloody in the night. I could tell by the way he softened that he pitied us. San Tomas has some of the best doctors in this part of the world, he said. If your father's life is meant to be saved, these men will save it. The priest closed his eyes and I knew he was seeing it again, Dad's rotting leg. I saw it too. It was burned into the dark behind our eyelids. He tightened his hold on the crucifix around his neck. Then he opened his eyes and looked at us sincerely. His voice was as soft as a whisper. Your father should not be alive. God is truly walking with this man. God may have been walking with Dad that day, but Dad himself would never walk again. The doctors found rot running all the way up to his hip, so that's where they amputated. The place where Dad's leg once met his pelvis was now just a concave socket, the size of a baby's head with prickly stitches like long, black caterpillars, holding the skin in place. There was a tube in Dad's arm for morphine and fluids, one in his chest to pump antibiotics in, and another beneath the covers to pump other things out. A long time passed before Dad was conscious enough to speak. Father Clausen made arrangements for us to stay at the convent in San Tomas, where the nuns treated us like children. They did not know the things we had seen. When Dad started to come around, the doctor called Father Clausen and he drove us from the convent to the hospital in his big green Buick. I stood beside Dad's bed so excited I began to cry. Dad opened his eyes then closed them for so long I was afraid he'd drifted off again. But at last he broke the seal of scum cementing his lips together, and the first thing he said was, Where is it? Father Clausen looked at us and we both shrugged our shoulders. Dad? Murray sat gently with tears on his cheeks. We're here. Simon and I and Father Clausen... You're going to be all right. 
Rory's throat caught and he glanced at the lopsided mound of blankets covering Dad's lower body. I, I, I mean, you're going to make it. You're not going to die. Dad didn't say anything for a minute. I squeezed his hand. His head turned on his pillow and he looked at me incredulously. Then you hear me ask you a question, son. I said, Where the fuck is my goddamn leg? Back in the waiting room, the doctor with the accent of the bent scissors spoke to Father Clausen in a rapid, rolling language. Father Clausen looked at the floor with his hands clasped behind his back, nodding. When the doctor was finished, the father turned to us and said, The doctors think that your father's fever has damaged part of his brain. I stammered, stunned and confused, but Rourke was angry. His fists were tight balls at his sides. The problem with our dad was his leg, father, or didn't you see it? Because I did, and my little brother sure did. A fever can't change a person that way. When I had the mumps, I was as hot as a skillet for three days, couldn't bear a stitch of clothing or a spoonful of broth, and I didn't wake up a swearing blasphemer. Father Clausen nodded, still looking at the floor, this time with his hands clasped in front of him. He started to say something, then stopped, as if he changed his mind about what to say. He started again, carefully. Son, every part of a man is controlled by a specific part of his brain. When one part of the brain is damaged, he might forget how to walk. Another part and he forgets how to swallow, or how to speak, or how to read, or, or write, or do arithmetic. These doctors say that sometimes, not very often, but sometimes, a very special part of the brain gets hurt and the person forgets what kind of person he is. They think that in your dad's case, the fever just... burned that part of him away. Father Clausen put his hand on Rory's shoulder. May God be with you, boys. The church will do everything it can to help you and your father through this... this trial. You must have faith. Rourke clenched his fists more tightly and shrugged out from under Father Clausen's hand. God had his chance, Father, and the church brought us to this Gomorrah to begin with. I don't think we'd like any help from either of you. In fact, I think my brother and I ought to be alone right now. He took me by the arm and began to turn away. Father Clausen's voice called out. This is a time for joining together in prayer, not for casting blame. Rourke did not turn back. There's one more thing, called the priest. Something in his voice made Rory stop. Your father says he won't leave here without his leg. The man in the hospital bed had Dad's face, but nothing else about him was the same. When the nurses came to change his bandages, he waited until they were leaning over him before he tweaked their nipples through their smocks and asked if all the women from their country were sluts on wheels with titties of steel. He held his fork with the wrong hand and laughed at things that weren't funny. They wanted to know where the fuck were his goddamn cigarettes, wide filter Paul Malls, as if he'd smoked them every day of his life. Even his breath smelled different. I know. Because right before we landed in Massachusetts, he grabbed my collar and pulled me close. Those olive-eaten soul bones said they'd never seen the bug I got, he told me, his voice low. He was so close I could feel hot breath in my nostrils. Said maybe it was the first time anyone got it. Anywhere in the whole world. And I said, isn't that something? Hey, why don't pack the whole thing up and ship it back to the good old US of A? Maybe have the fellows from the Mayo take a look at it. For research, you know. Just so I can make sure I do my part. He smiled a smile that made his face dark. Then I looked at the sawbones with my eyes real big. 
big, wide crocodile eyes. And I say, I want to do my part to see this tragedy don't befall another living soul. Not if I can do anything about it. He laughed Swedish breath into my face and I recoiled. He yanked me fiercely back to him. It belongs to me, after all. It's my goddamn leg. You can't just toss someone's leg in the garbage like a used rubber. So they said, yeah, maybe I had a point. Those brains at the Mayo are thinking up new medicines all the time. Pills to stop your headache, cure the clap. Even pills to make your dick hard. Those guys may have something doing. So the Sawbones trusted up in a big glass tube full of some of the formaldehyde stuff, locked it in with these big steel caps. I saw them loading it into the cargo hold. Looks like the biggest pickled pig's foot you ever saw. He laughed again. There was a rattle and a lurch as the landing gear deployed. We were back in Boston, but it didn't feel like home. Nothing was the same. I'll be fucked if those needle dicks at the Mayo Clinic ever get their hands on it. It's mine. Nat pulled me so close his nose touched the skin on my forehead and his voice fell to a whisper that made my skin break into goose flesh. Do you hear me, son? It's mine. Father Clausen had arranged a one-bedroom apartment for us on a sloppy street beside an Italian restaurant. It was close to St. Elizabeth's, the hospital where Dad could go if he needed to see a doctor. And I mean the other sort of doctor, too, Father Clausen reminded us. A psychiatrist. If he gets any worse, or if you boys are ever afraid he'll hurt you, just pick up the phone and call St. Elizabeth's right away. I've written the number to the psychiatric crisis line right here next to the phone. They also said the church would pay all of Dad's medical bills, so none to worry about that. And there was a Murphy bed in the living room, he told us. Said there would be room for all of us as long as my brother and I shared a bed. He spoke a last hurried blessing, and then he left. The apartment smelled like garlic bread and had nubby carpeting with gold and burgundy curlicues, like carpet from a movie theater lobby. There was something called a kitchenette, which was a half-sized icebox, a sink, and a hot plate on an island of dingy linoleum that curled up where it met the carpet. Father Clausen said he chose this apartment because it had belonged to a man with polio. The door that led in from the alley had a wide ramp and a rail for Dad's wheelchair, and above the bathtub and toilet were special bars where he could grab on if he needed to. The countertops in the kitchen and bathroom were only half as high as normal so he could reach everything. Dad sat in his wheelchair in the kitchenette, smoking palm malls and yelling slurs at the two black porters who had toted our luggage from the airport. We didn't have much, mostly just second-hand clothes and dishes from the nuns in San Tomas. The pair of big men struggled up the wheelchair ramp with something heavy wrapped in black duvetine. They set it down in the corner and were wiping their brows when Dad yelled, You stupid spooks! Are you going to put that right in front of the radiator? He dropped his cigarette in the sink and wheeled angrily across the room. Be careful with that, goddammit! Do you even know what this is? He yanked off the duvetine. Rory and I froze, staring, not believing. It's my goddamn leg! That's what it is! There it was. Dad's rotten leg bobbing inside a glass tube as high as my shoulders. Steel caps closed the tube at the top and bottom, bolted tight with pieces that looked like chrome lug nuts. A paper with a big orange symbol that said biohazard stuck to the glass with strips of wrinkly white tape, and a few paragraphs of medical words filled the space beneath the symbol. Beyond that, the gray mess of craters and boils floated like a fleshy jellyfish in the pale yellow preservative. Cost me half my nutsack and a gold pocket watch. Good thing you darkies are hot for bribes and shiny things or it'd be halfway to Alabama by now, on its way to be poked apart by some egghead with a microscope up his ass. One of the black men took a step toward Dad, 
looked like he might hit him, but the other man touched his elbow and shook his head. And after that, they both left and closed the door behind them. The lights in our new apartment were dimmed by puddles of dead moths settled in their yellow fixtures. The fluorescent over the kitchenette flickered constantly, like it was sucking its electricity through a bent straw. There was not enough light, or space, or air. We all stood together in our new home, not speaking. Me, my brother, my dad, and his preserved amputated leg. Rory turned 17 that spring and fibbed himself a year older so he could join the Navy. I tried and begged him not to leave, but he went anyway. He hugged me and told me he'd be back before I knew it, but he couldn't look me in the eye, and we both knew he was abandoning me. He was leaving me alone with Dad. Dad smoked cigarettes all day and watched game shows on TV. The Price is Right was his favorite, he said, because when Bob Barker picked a pretty woman to guess the prices, you could see her tits bouncing as she ran down the stage. Hell, doesn't even have to be a pretty one, he said, lighting a fresh cigarette off the old one. We mostly ate takeout from White Castle and Carl's Jr., but sometimes at the end of the month, before Dad's disability check arrived, I'd use the hot plate to warm up food for us. Mostly frozen things, corn dogs, pizzas, chicken pot pies and flimsy tins made of foil. We'd eat off paper plates sitting at a card table we'd found folded up under Dad's bed. Once, I tried to make beef stroganoff, but when the time came to eat it, I couldn't. I couldn't get past the thick gravy and slippery noodles sliding over bits of meat. After the stroganoff, I had a hard time eating altogether. The feeling of chewed food churning around in my mouth made me sick to my stomach. I lost weight. I took long baths and showers, liking the feeling of scrubbed skin and the closed door between me and Dad. In the afternoons, I sat outside on the wheelchair ramp and pretended to read catalogs. From there, I could see people walking past on the sidewalk, but they couldn't see me. I saw the public school kids walking home from the bus stop, and housewives on their way back from the baker and the butcher. Once, I thought I saw the Irish girl walking past with a loaf of French bread and a sack of tangerines, but I couldn't be sure it was her. I couldn't remember if I'd ever seen her face. I slept long nights on the pilled mattress of the Murphy bed. Dad's leg glowered from its pedestal. A wooden table with one wobbly leg that Dad made Rory and me drag in off the curb. He said the table would hold fine as long as we propped the broken leg with a stack of flattened cigarette cartons. And it did. My dreams were bad and got worse as the summer wore on. The worst dream of all came on the night it happened. The night after the 4th of July. I remember because it was right before the heat wave broke. You remember? The bad one that tripped the grid and blacked out the entire east side? Has it been over a month already? Oh, Christ. <laughs> you lose track. That night was the hottest night I'd seen since the chapel in the jungle. The apartment was stale and suffocating, and the reek of garlic and cigarettes and formaldehyde was everywhere. I felt miserable and feverish. Even after I'd stripped down to my underwear and cranked the knob on the window fan as far as it would go, my stomach gnawed as I lay sleepless, watching red digits on the clock radio in the kitchenette stack minutes into hours. It was a little past three when I heard a crack like a gunshot, a transformer shorting out. The fan blade stopped whirring and all the street lamps went dark. I'd never thought about how much light comes in through a person's windows, even with the curtains closed. But, suddenly, the whole apartment was black as pitch. The clock radio clicked into battery mode and its red glow gave shape to the card table, the icebox, and the world's biggest pickled pig's foot. 
I heard the door to Dad's room creak open, telling me the Transformer had woken him up too, and he would need a couple cigarettes and a spoonful of coronation and maybe half an hour on the toilet listening to his own satisfied grunts to soothe him back to sleep. A sound came from the hall like something catching or dragging on the carpet. I tried to climb out of bed to help, thinking he'd wedged his wheels against the baseboards again. But, as always happens in nightmares, I found myself fixed flat on my back, paralyzed and numb. The dragging sound grew louder and closer. I panicked. Fear swarmed through me and I screamed at my frozen muscles, Get up! Get up, Jesus, get up! But my arms and legs were too heavy or too weak or too tired. My eyes raced to the only scrap of light, the red glow of the clock, and something was wrong. The light was all wrong. It wasn't doing something it usually did. It wasn't casting the right shadow on the linoleum. It wasn't casting the shadow of the leg. The leg was gone. The steel caps were still locked tightly in place, but nothing floated in the yellow preservative except a layer of fallen off bits that formed chunky sediment at the bottom of the tube. The dragging came again, this time right next to the Murphy band. I squeezed my eyes shut, pressing hot tears between my eyelashes, and for the first time in a long time, my lips moved silently in frantic prayer. Slowly, I rolled my eyes to the side of my head, and I saw it. The ghastly, rotten leg. It was coming for me, sliding through the dark, using the rubbery remains of its toes to drag itself across the rough theater lobby carpet. Strings of flesh and the knob of a jellied femur left a trail of preservative to show where it had been. And I could smell it. Not the formaldehyde smell, but the smell from beneath the palmettos. The smell of maggots feasting on raw cheeseburgers. Of flesh rotting in the tropical sun. I felt a tug at the sheets and the exposed knuckle of the leg's big toe appeared above the mattress. I felt myself losing it, delirious with fear. Then came the second toe, struggling over the hump, gripping the sheet like a monkey to pull itself up, up, up onto the mattress. The other toes followed as the leg slithered into bed with me. I gagged on the stench and the fear and the feel of spongy flesh against my belly. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I was going to drown in fear. I shut my eyes and felt my heart thump out one more massive helping of blood before everything went bright white. And then I was awake. I leapt out of bed and wheeled around, sweeping my eyes to the tube in the corner. It bobbed there, innocently in the red glow, as if to say, See? I've been right here the whole time. The blood rushed from my head and I dropped to my hands and knees, weak. My ribs stood out from my chest as I breathed in and out. My heart skipped and started. I think I might have brayed out for a while. I was so tired. So tired and so hungry and so weak. I looked up at the leg. Hating it. I wanted everything back the way it was. I wanted to walk into our old kitchen and find Dad standing on two feet in front of the stove, flipping a batch of his famous hotcakes and practicing aloud his sermon for the day. I wanted Rory to come back and make me believe I wasn't alone anymore. I wanted to sink my teeth into a hamburger, or a banana, or a slice of roast beef without feeling my tongue begin to explore its imaginary craters and boils. I wanted to be rid of it. All of it! The tube was easier to break than you'd think. 
It really only took one good whack with the hot plate to shatter the entire thing. Dad heard the noise, of course, but he must have considered his own obvious limitations because he didn't even try to pull me off. He screamed curses at me from his wheelchair, and when that didn't work, he dialed the number Father Clausen had written next to the phone. Then, you guys came, and brought me here. At first you strapped me to the bed, but I got that privilege back for good behavior. I'm not sure how long it took you guys to arrive after Dad called. I don't really remember that part at all. I expect it probably took longer than usual on account of the blackout. All I remember is a terrible, throbbing urgency to have Dad back. The real Dad. The dad who'd made us pancakes and hated the smell of ashtrays and who stood sweating before a tribe of villagers intent only on the word of God. The dad who'd said in a voice I can now recall only as an echo, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My face is raw from tears, and my hands have been shaking for almost an hour. Why did he do this to me? I don't understand. I pick up my phone and redial my boyfriend's number, praying with all my soul for a different result. Once again, my hopes were shattered upon hearing a message saying that the number wasn't accepting incoming calls. Caught up in my heartache, I dial star 67 before his number and call again. It rings. His phone rings and rings until I get a message saying that his voicemail box is full. Opening the Facebook app on my phone, I type in his name. No results pop up in the search engine. I mean, what? Switching over to an ancient profile of mine, I search again. There he is. All the pictures posted were ones that he sent me. Under the About section, it says that he is engaged? What the fuck? He and I had talked about marriage for months now, but he's never asked me officially. I mean, did I miss something here? Then a post from someone that I didn't recognize, Rita Jacobs, posted, I love you so much, next to a picture of a three-stone engagement ring. The same kind of ring that I told him I had wanted. Furthering my emotional path of self-destruction, I clicked on her profile. Her about section also listed that she was engaged to Eric Dodd. No, Eric Dodd is my boyfriend. Not even one week ago, he blew up my phone with calls and text messages. Then one day, I got a text saying that he was arrested and would be in jail for a while. Okay, well, if he'd been detained, I would have been able to find the police report and a mugshot, which I didn't. Also, if he'd been in jail for an extended period... His phone would have died. Also posted is a picture of this sweetest looking little boy with all too familiar eyes. The caption read, We miss you, Daddy. A barren ache in my throat snaps me back to attention. I realize that my mouth's been hanging open for quite a while. My heart feels like an empty can being crushed in slow motion. Eric doesn't have any children. He told me that he wanted me to be the only one to carry his children. She posted a video and tagged him in it. The YouTube video was to the Chicago song, You're the Inspiration. And that was a song he had always sent to me to make up after a fight. He told me that was our song. I run to my sink and empty the sparse contents of my formerly starving stomach inside of it. My heaves give way to fresh tears that burn my irritated eyes. My stomach aches. Each piece of new information is a sucker punch to my heart and gut. Pause. Okay, so you may have some questions. First off, no, I am not completely stupid or blind. There were no signs Eric exhibited that I chose to ignore. We'd been together in our late teens and were madly in love, to my knowledge. He was forced to move away with his parents and left my life completely. Thanks to the wonders of social media, we reconnected 11 years later. 
He lived many states away, but drove down to see me for a four-day weekend once a month. I had my issues and situations that didn't permit me to visit him in his home state. He never seemed to have a problem with always having to be the one to make the drive. I guess I know why now. So that's how I didn't know. That's how I was able to be made such a fool of. The chump of all chumps. Play. I throw open my dresser drawer and search frantically for my medicine bottle. My doctor had prescribed me clonopin a few months back for anxiety, but I had resisted taking it until now. My phone was clenched in my hand with a white knuckle grip. The urge to dial his number was consuming me more with every heartbeat. I knew that I wasn't likely to stop if I started calling, and I felt like enough of an idiot already. Why? He said so many things to me. He shared so many heartfelt stories, made many promises, and envisioned many things for our future. I mean, why? What was the point of any of it? All the jewelry he bought me, the way he held me and whispered sweet sentiments in my ear as we slept, all the laughter that we shared, him begging me to let him be the shoulder that I cry on. We shared our deepest secrets and... For all I know, every word he uttered was deceptive. I mean, I'm not perfect, but I was always upfront about my bullshit. I don't trust that many people. He knew that. He knew that everyone who I've ever loved had either died or decided that they had a better life without me. I mean, hell, to be honest, if he were just straight with me from the beginning, I probably would have still been with him. But to ghost me like that, at our age go from talk of marriage and baby names, Christopher for a boy, Brienne for a girl, by the way, to blocked without a word. There was no, hey, this isn't working. No, yeah, I'm gonna have to pass. No, go fuck yourself. Nothing. I honestly thought he was dead for the first 24 hours of no contact. Not to even mention that that very first day was my 33rd birthday. He told me weeks ago that he couldn't come down because of work. I'm not even making this shit up. I wish to God that I was. This is a fuck you that's messed up on a level that my soul can barely fathom, let alone fabricate. Fast forward eight hours. I decided to go to a bar in town called Killian's to try and break my cycle of rumination. There are enough people inside for the atmosphere to be welcoming, but not so many that I felt suffocated. As I hopped up onto it, scooting closer to the bar counter... A man with shaggy dark hair that hangs in his face sits two stools over to my left. There's a brief nod of acknowledgement exchanged. I'm trying to be polite more than anything, honestly. Not to say that I don't notice how amazing he smells as I wait for my drink. Before long, I'm wondering what color his eyes are. And not that it matters really with all that hair in his face. The ghost of Eric's face fades from my mind more with every drink. Things are going well, and I have high hopes for a peaceful, blacked-out sleep tonight. My desire is to be dead to the world like I feel on the inside. I want to wake up when it doesn't hurt so much anymore. The music player that they had clicked over to a new song. I could barely begin my ears as the familiar notes started to play. I try to stifle an involuntary moan of pure sorrow, but the sound escapes my lips all the same. That's our song. Or is it their song? The song. Tears shine the skin of my cheeks like clear nail polish. My heartbreak painted on my face for all to see. There's a sudden heat and pressure on the back of my chair. The smell of musk, leather, and the slightest hint of motor oil pleasantly invades my senses. It's the man with the dark hair. Hey, love. What's this? What's a nice bit of fluff like you up to 90 for? My face melts at his Irish accent, but I have no idea what he's saying. He can tell as much by the look on my face. Why are you crying? Don't tell me it's over some wagon. Any fella would be lucky to have you for a mutt. I immediately make a mental note to Google Irish slang when I get home. He hands me a napkin. I take it and smile weakly at him, finally composing myself enough to meet his eyes. Huh, they're green. Not just any green, either. The most 
beautiful shade, just like emeralds. I've never seen eyes so beautiful. My eyes take their time, leaving his gaze. Coyly, I reply that I don't want to burden anyone with my troubles. However, before the hour passes, I find myself verbally unloading my situation in its entirety. A look of pity mixed with concern washes over his face. Oh, I bet that's absolutely scarlet for you. You loved him for a donkey's year and the whole time he was acting the maggot. Somehow, this time, I understand what he's saying. My sniffling slows as I nod in agreement. He continues. I know you feel pure gabby right now, but you seem like a nice girl. I interrupted him. Uh, forgive my ignorance, but you're gonna have to dumb it down a bit for me here. I'm having trouble understanding you. He lets out a laugh that brings out a twinkle in his eyes. The sound dances through the bar like wind chimes on a breezy day. I'm trying to say that no lash deserves to be treated that way. Especially not on her birthday. Did you even have a cake? No. Let me hit the jacks and I'll be right with you. The charming stranger disappears into the men's room. When he gets back, I ask him what his name is. Name's Kevin. What do they call you? His accent's still apparent, but at least I can understand him now. Reluctantly, I answered him. Call me Karen. I'm not letting my smile show just yet, but I know my eyes gave me away. Kevin and Karen! (laughs) He says, his chuckle booming heartily through the bar. A server comes out from the kitchen with a large piece of cake and brings it up to the bar. She sets it down in front of me, smiles, and walks away. I turn to Kevin. Red Velvet is my absolute favorite. (laughs) What's this about? This time, a complete smile blooms on my face like the first flower of spring. Kevin takes out a single candle from his breast jacket pocket. He looks dapper as hell in his brown suit, complemented by the slightest accents of green. The candle's color matches the green of his suit, but with a silver swirl throughout it. This is the most beautifully detailed birthday candle I've ever seen. He held a large stone that I somehow had missed before in his other hand. Taken aback, I push away from the bar a bit and hop off the stool. What is that? Why do you have it? Let's see where this goes. There are too many people here for him to attack me with it. I mean, hell, it's been such a shitty week and you can't go wrong with free cake. Garen, take the candle and push it into the cake. After I light it, close your eyes, grab the stone and concentrate. Think about how you want that bastard to suffer. Think of all the ways your life would be better if he had never been born. Dwell on all the empty promises he made. As you blow out your candle, turn the stone counterclockwise. He thrusts the candle into my hand, and I gladly take it. Placing the candle into the soft red velvet, I concentrate. I wish Eric could feel what I've been feeling for the past week. I wish that he was held to every single promise that he's ever made to a woman. My heart and soul aren't to be taken for granted. They deserve to be avenged. Eric must pay for what he's done to me, and who knows how many other women... I blow out the candle and turn the stone in one fluid motion. Though not within the realm of possibility for my current location, I swear I felt a slight breeze drift through the whole bar once my candle flame died. Other than that small and possibly fabricated detail, I felt no different. Kevin and I continued talking throughout the evening. We both lost track of time and it was almost one in the morning before long. This is the longest that I've gone without thinking about Eric, and I'm not ready for it to end. I break out my dancing bedroom eyes and turn on some charm of my own. Eric certainly didn't give me a second thought while he fucked Rita night after night. It's time to stop worrying about him and start caring about me. Kevin was only in town for the week of St. Patrick's Day and stayed in a hotel not too far from Killian's. His room had that same wonderful smell that he did. It's almost like he sweats pure testosterone, sex, and cologne. Our tongues and lips dance in the most erotic but natural way. It all feels incredible. I'll leave the rest of the night to your lurid imaginations, but I woke up a happy bit of fluff. I learned last night that that phrase is meant to describe attractive girls. 
Stereotypical and offensive as this may be, I found myself humming Danny Boy the whole way home. Dropkick Murphys is instantly added to my playlist as I replay the night I spent with an Irish god. The tingles still linger on my skin. My second week without Eric is blissful. The memories of my exotic stranger refresh me. A banging on my door startles me out of peaceful sleep. My dragging body trudges towards the door and I stare out of the peephole. My heart plummets at the sight of a very disheveled Eric standing on my doorstep. A week ago, I would have traded anything to be in this situation, but now I find myself barely wanting to answer the door. I do, though. No use letting him stand out there. Karen! Oh my god, baby! He throws his arms around me and squeezes tightly. Honey, I'm so sorry. I messed up so badly. You have to help me. I should never have hurt you as I did. Tears are spilling over his cheeks and his voice is shrill with panic. I killed someone. I don't know why I did it, but I killed her. Despite his terror, I can't help but interrupt him. You mean Rita? He winces at the sound of her name. Oh, Jesus, Karen, I'm sorry. I never meant for you to find out. I blocked contact because I didn't have the heart to tell you. It's always been you. My heart's been torn between my obligations and what it wants. I tried to leave her so many times. He quickly changes the subject upon seeing rage flash through my eyes. No, it wasn't her. When Rita was pregnant, I had a woman on the side. Rita found out about it and made me promise never to speak to her again. She made me promise her repeatedly that the woman's life never meant a thing to me. She asked me if I would care if the other woman died, and I said no. That doesn't mean I wanted her dead. I haven't even thought about her in years. A sinister chuckle travels through my soul, up to my throat, then out into the atmosphere. <laughs> so, you use me, sleep with me, lie to me, then expect me to aid in a better crime by letting you stay here? You deserve what you get, dick. You're not my problem anymore, and lucky I don't call the cops right now. I don't want to know any more information. Just leave. Now I see it. There's that look I've been craving. One of pure hopelessness and shock at my refusal to help him. I've always loved his eyes. I gave him all the contents of my heart. There's nothing left to heal or forgive. He must deal with the consequences of his actions. He leaves, walking out backward for whatever reason. I get dressed and head to Kevin's motel in a fit of spiteful adrenaline. Supposedly, he's here for four more days, so I should be able to catch him. The muscle memory of my feet takes me right to his door, room 1014. I knock and can hear a shuffling from inside. The smell turns me on instantly, even from outside the room. Kevin answers the door. I put on my widest doe eyes while asking, hoping to further my chances. Somehow he's even more handsome in this surprised, rugged state. Hey, Kevin, can I come in? I've had a weird night and need someone. Have any Jameson left? He opens the door wider to let me inside. Putting pride aside, I sit down on his bed. We need to talk. Eric came to see me all wigged out. He says he just killed some lady, not his wife, by the way. I just needed to leave the house for a bit in case he tried to come back. My body is trembling with attraction, but it could very easily be perceived as fear of Eric. I'll let him think that. He lets out that booming, dark laugh that I love so much. Nothing to fear, Karen. It is only the beginning of this gobshite's journey to hell. He explains further once he sees the confusion on my face. Why is everyone so surprised when they make a wish and it comes true? Isn't that the point of things? What did you wish for when you turned to Bullenstone? I answer him quickly, but only answer his question with one of my own. Uh, what's a Bullenstone? It's an Irish cursing stone that was used in conjunction with an Irish wishing candle. It grants your birthday wish. 
I shake my head with a chuckle of disbelief. I am shocked at the level of bullshit he is spitting right now. So, what, you're like some kind of leprechaun? His eyes narrow, and it's the closest thing I've seen to anger that he's shown so far. Leprechaun? Come now, Mott. Am I half-sized with flaming hair and a pipe? Haven't you ever heard of the Black Irish? It's not all freckles and red hair, you know. Now he's the one to shake his head at me, clearly offended. Unfortunately for me, it appeared I would not be taming the snake this St. Pat's. I quickly apologize, gather myself, and leave. I thank him for everything he's done for me on my way out. A month goes by, completely uneventful. I started to put this all behind me one day at a time. Dating is definitely off of the table for a good while. Painting always used to be cathartic, so I recently picked it up here. I was in the middle of a black and red sunflower when there was an odd sound at my door. It sounds like someone was knocking, but from the bottom of the door. There's no one visible through the peephole. Slowly, I open the door to see what's going on. A trail of red consumes the entire middle of my porch, ending at Eric's feet. The bottoms of his jeans are caked in brown and red. A bit of bone sticks out from the bottom of his left pant leg. I don't see any shoes or feet. Eric lays there sobbing, his face a sickly shade of purple. Help me in. I walked all the way here from home. I couldn't stop walking. So much walking. My feet. I need an ambulance, but I can't call them because of the police. Help me, please. I hurriedly dragged him inside, doing my best to clean the floor on the way. He settles uncomfortably on the couch. I ran to my bathroom to get towels and water, and a gut-wrenching scream comes from where I just left Eric. I know we've had our differences, but my blood can't help but run cold when I see him. His face is a mess of gore. Where his two perfect hazel eyes used to be, now were two bleeding sockets. He held his hands out toward me. I always said I only had eyes for you. It makes sense now. Eric always promised me that he would walk to the ends of the earth to get to me, though it wasn't that extreme of a distance. He promised me he would never turn his back on me. That's why he left walking backward from my house. He promised Rita that girl's life meant nothing to him. He promised me that he only had eyes for me. There's just one thing left. I sit on my living room floor, cutting with a surgical precision that surprises me. This is messier than I want it to be, and I severely hate to share. I'm not the only one he's hurt, though. I'll keep the biggest piece for myself and give the girls the other pieces. The first promise he ever made to me was that I'd always have a piece of his heart. Jeff Kramer sat on the front porch, casually smoking a cigarette. He took a drag and leaned back in his metal chair, wondering if he had missed anything about Cannon City. Fifteen years, he thought to himself. They passed like the smoke that drifted gently into the night sky. Suddenly, the quiet moment was disrupted by his girlfriend, Mallory, who yelled from the kitchen. Jeff, can you take this trash out? His hand jerked, causing the ash from his cigarette to go flying. He took one last puff and flicked the butt into the driveway. I was just out front finishing a cigarette. The trash ain't going nowhere. Mallory smiled. Exactly. It ain't going nowhere unless you bring it to the barrel. Jeff had spent the day packing his belongings into a U-Haul trailer. He had accepted the promotion at a small outline in prison in Meeker, Colorado, and was leaving in the morning. Mallory was staying behind. Despite how things may have looked on the outside, Mallory had a hard time hiding her reservations. She felt that Jeff had once again chose work over her. 
Jeff grappled with trying to please her while at the same time fulfilling his dream to live in a small rural town. While lying in bed, Mallory turned to him. I hope you don't feel like I'm trying to hold you back or that I've become a burden to you. Why would you think that? Jeff responded as he ran his fingers through her hair. Well, it's just a feeling that I get sometimes. Her eyes teared up. I know it's going to be tough at first, but as soon as you sell the house, you're going to move up there with me, right? Mallory sniffled and turned on her back. But it's not just that. I get another feeling, too. What? It's like an anxious feeling, like the timing is wrong. She sighed. It's hard to explain. Jeff smiled and gently kissed her on the cheek. It's just nerves. I'm sure it's no different than what I'm feeling, too. The next morning, Jeff finished up loading the last of his stuff into his trailer. After he latched the door, he paused and took one last look around the neighborhood. Mallory watched from the storm door. Her eyes were bloodshot from crying, which seemed to illuminate their blue color. He got into his truck and waved. I love you. I'll call you when I get up there. Mallory waved back as she gazed longingly through the window. While sitting in traffic, Jeff picked up a travel brochure that was sitting on his seat. The caption read, Meeker, Colorado. Experience the Old West. Hunting, fishing, hiking, and even a theatrical town square gunfight show complete with simulated public hanging. Small town charm with plenty of big city amenities. He grinned as he sat the brochure back down. He could almost hear the zing of his fishing pole line as it cut the water with a rainbow trout on the end of his hook. By late afternoon, Jeff had arrived at the house he would be renting. The property belonged to a man by the name of Alan Rich. He was also employed by the state and transferring to the same prison complex that Jeff had worked at. Jeff, who was filling Rich's position at Meeker Correctional Center, stumbled across the house when looking for rental properties. It was located just outside of Meeker, about 30 minutes from Rifle, Colorado. The two men discovered the coincidence when talking on the phone. Rich was a stiff-looking man with a large build and a military-style buzz cut. His eyes were beady, almost penetrating, and reminded Jeff of the rats you would sometimes see near the heater vents in the cell house. I've been waiting here since 2 o'clock. I take it traffic was bad, huh? Rich said sarcastically. Jeff smiled. Yeah, a little bit. There's a few more things I want to show you before I leave. Rich took Jeff to the edge of the stairs that led to the basement and then turned to him with a serious look on his face. This house was built by a hand by my father, back when men built their own houses. You don't see this kind of craftsmanship anymore. Rich then reached up and turned on the light. It was the old pull chain top and was covered in a layer of dust. The stairs creaked under the stress of the men's weight. As they reached the bottom and turned the corner, Jeff expected to see a dusty, dingy space. Instead, he was surprised to see a fully finished basement, complete with a pool table and built-in wet bar. Jeff's eyes lit up. I missed this when I came through the first time. Rich smiled, then walked over to the bar and reached under the table. He pulled out two shot glasses and a bottle of Kentucky bourbon. You drink? Some, Jeff responded. Good, because I don't trust a man that doesn't. Rich poured two shots and pushed one towards Jeff. He raised his glass. Salut. Jeff toasted him and drank his shot. This was my dad's bar. When I was little, him and my mom would throw parties down here. You can have full access to it. The only thing I ask is if you finish a bottle, just replace it. Rich placed the shot glasses in the metal sink and then proceeded back upstairs. He took Jeff through the garage and into the backyard. The house sits on an acre. Now I know you're just renting the place, but I still expect the grass to get mowed and the weeds to be cut down. Any big projects like trees or shrubs, I'll handle. Jeff's eyes were drawn to an old wooden shed that sat at the edge of the property. Is the shed for storage? The shed's locked up, Rich said sternly. It's just a bunch of my dad's old junk sitting in it. 
As soon as I get the space, I'll get it cleaned out. Rich then turned to Jeff. So, you ready to sign the lease? Jeff smiled widely. Well, I gotta have somewhere to unpack my crap at. After he had signed all the paperwork, Rich pulled out two sets of keys and sat them on the table. If you have any problems, you have my number. All the utilities are paid through the end of the month. Rich then picked up his copy of the lease and placed it in a manila envelope. He shook Jeff's hand and as he walked out the door, muttered something under his breath. Jeff looked up, but Rich was already gone. After a few minutes, Jeff stepped out onto the back porch and thought a cigarette seemed fitting. He leaned against the iron railing and took a drag as he peered off into the distance. A voice softly whispered in his ear. Welcome home. He looked around startled, but no one was there. Slowly, he crept down the porch steps as his eyes panned the yard. He followed the fence line until he came upon the wooden shed that sat at the edge of the property. He looked up at it curiously. The paint was faded and flaking off, and an old master lock secured the two rickety doors. He stood there for a few moments until he finished his cigarette. I just know you're going to love this place, Jeff said to Mallory over the phone. Really? Yeah, it just has a charm to it, and you should see the downstairs. I don't know why there weren't more pics of it on the website. Was the landlord nice? Mallory asked. He was kind of uptight. We mainly just went over paperwork. Jeff left it at that. Well, I need to start unpacking before it gets too late. After he hung up, he tugged at his t-shirt to get some airflow. The ceiling fan in the living room squeaked as it struggled to keep up. Jeff walked over and flipped on the central air, then began unloading his trailer. That first night was restless. Jeff tossed and turned for what seemed like hours before finally falling asleep. Soon he began to dream. In the dream, he's chopping wood in the backyard. He hears a car horn and walks around to the front of his house, carrying his axe. It's Mallory's Toyota pickup. She hopped out of the cab and ran to him. I wanted to surprise you today, she exclaimed. Jeff stood there emotionless. She wrapped her arms around him and buried her head into his chest. His expression turned from a blank stare to a psychotic grin. You're so thoughtful. He raised his arms to hug her, resting the axe on her shoulder blade. In the next sequence, they're laying in bed together. Shadows dance to the rhythmic flicker of the candlelight. He slowly begins kissing her neck. She smiles and runs her hand down his back. Suddenly, he gets more aggressive, biting at her and restraining both of her wrists. As she begins to struggle and cry out, he looks up into the mirror that hung from the headboard. It's not his reflection that he sees, but riches. Shadows blacked out his eyes, and he grinned devilishly. At that moment, Jeff awoke. His chest was pounding and sweat beaded on his forehead. He sat up and turned to look into the mirror on his headboard. Thank God, he thought to himself, I'm still me. The next day, he spent getting the house in order. As night came, he sat in his recliner next to the lamp, studying facility regulations. His bifocals rested snugly on the tip of his nose as he flipped through the pages. A thought entered his mind. The shed. There was something special. Something that was meant just for him that was inside there. It seemed to come out of nowhere, but just as quickly as it crept into his mind, it was gone. He shifted his eyes back to his notebook and continued reading. It was the final week of Jeff's vacation before starting his new position. He was sitting on his back steps looking at his phone when he heard a voice holler from next door. Hey, neighbor! Jeff looked up, shielding his eyes from the sun. An older, white-haired man in suspenders casually strode towards him. The name's Glenn Spurlock. Jeff walked over and met him at the fence. I'm Jeff Kramer. I moved in about a week ago. I seen that. I didn't even know Alan was selling the place until I seen the sign. 
He grinned. Are you from around here? Cannon City. Really? My wife has some family out near Fremont County. They both stood there talking for some time, and Jeff soon found himself taking a liking to Glenn. Later that night, they sat out on Glenn's patio playing cards. Me and the wife were good friends with the riches, Glenn said, then paused to take a swig of his beer. We would get together almost every Friday night, he smiled thoughtfully. That all changed once Karen, Alan's mother, got sick. Once Hank couldn't take care of her anymore, she went into a nursing home. Sometime later, I heard she passed away. Glenn got a serious expression on his face. I probably shouldn't be telling you all this. Jeff listened intently. What happened to her husband? Uh, Hank became a recluse after that. We would see him less and less until one day we didn't see him at all. Did he also pass away? Glenn sighed. (sighs) He took his own life. Jeff grimaced. Really? My understanding was Alan came over one day to check on him and found his body inside the house. Jeff's eyes got big. He died? Inside the house that I'm renting? Listen, back in the old days, it wasn't uncommon for people to pass away inside their homes. They didn't have nursing homes or hospice like today. Dying of natural causes is one thing, but suicide? Glenn shrugged his shoulders. Alan and Jessica lived in there up until about six months ago when they split up. Jeff looked back at his house with buyer's remorse. After another poker hand, the men decided to call it a night. As Jeff turned to walk back home, Glenn motioned to him. Listen, out of respect for the family, don't go repeating what I told you. I just figured you'd find out sooner or later. Jeff nodded. By afternoon, the thermometer on the back porch registered 91. Jeff wiped the sweat from his brow and found himself holding his cordless drill, standing in front of the shed in his backyard. As he stood there, the same fleeting voice he heard on his porch whispered through the trees. Go ahead, open it. It's waiting for you inside. He lifted the drill and feverishly began unscrewing the hinge that was secured by a rusted out master lock. As the doors flung open, he found the inside was empty, except for a single object that was covered by a large tarp. Jeff grabbed his flashlight and stepped inside. Funny, he thought to himself. He remembered Rich saying that he didn't have room for all the stuff that was in there. He shined his light on the object and slowly peeled back the tarp. It was a chest made out of wood. It looked to be cedar. He smiled with the light and his eyes seemed to gleam as his flashlight beam reflected off them. He bent down and wiggled the handle, but it was locked. Carefully, he hoisted it onto a dolly that he got from the garage. As he wheeled it through the backyard, he looked around nervously, as if he expected Rich to pull up at any minute. There were no visible screws that fastened the lock to the chest, so Jeff tried his luck at picking it. After several attempts with no success, he finally heard a click. He undid both latches and the lid made a squeaking sound as it slowly opened. Inside was an antique record player and several stacks of records. Jeff grabbed one and blew off the dust. Robert Johnson, Crossroad Blues, the cover read. He sat it back down and picked up the record player, placing it on his workbench. He then slipped the record out of its sleeve and placed it on the turntable. Before he had a chance to wind the crank, the record began to spin. He backed away frantically, tripping over the chest and bumping his head on a shelf. As he lay on the ground dazed, he looked up at the record player. The needle slowly raised and moved itself onto the record. The old brass horn let out a hissing and popping noise before opening with a soulful guitar riff. Jeff began to panic as he desperately looked around the garage. Suddenly, the window next to his workbench blew out. He screamed and shielded his face from the shards of glass that landed on him. 
The music continued to play in the background unabated. Jeff, Jeff, are you okay? Jeff, are you okay? Jeff slowly opened his eyes. Glenn was hunched over him, slapping him in the face. As he helped him to his feet, he winced and rubbed the back of his head. Thanks. I tripped over this damn chest and lost my balance. I ran over when I heard your window shatter. What happened? Jeff looked over at the window and then looked down. I don't know. I don't exactly remember. The record was no longer playing and the needle rested back in its holder. Uh, well, here, let me give you a hand cleaning this mess up, Glenn said as he grabbed the broom. After the two got the mess cleaned up, Jeff boarded up the window. He glanced over at the record player, which sat unassuming on top of his workbench. Still trying to make sense of what happened, he gathered his courage and cranked the handle several turns. Nothing happened. He cranked it again and backed away. Still, the turntable failed to spin. He looked it over and then decided to reenact the same sequence of events that led up to the strange phenomenon. He placed the record back in its sleeve, laid the record player in the chest, and then repeated the process. Still, the turntable didn't budge. With a puzzled look on his face, he placed the record player back in the trunk. The hinges shrieked as he closed the lid. Row call began at 0545. Jeff sat near the front of the room where most of the new hires and transfers were ostracized to. He was now sporting a tight buzz cut, and absent were the gold-rimmed glasses that he had worn since he was a kid. Towards the back, where the light dimmed and the hum of the coke machine was deafening, sat Whispers and Sergeant Espinosa. Whispers' real name was Patrick Harper, but everyone called him Whispers because of an assault at the penitentiary that damaged his vocal cords. He elbowed Espinosa in the side. I take it that's the new lieutenant. Espinosa looked up. Yeah, he looks like an asshole. Just another limp dick like the last one. I wouldn't be surprised if Carlson brought him up here to spy on everyone. After he finished taking attendance, Captain Carlson motioned to Jeff as he spoke to the room. This is Lieutenant Kramer. He'll be the new shift commander on days. Jeff turned to everyone and waved. As they walked into the complex, Carlson pulled Jeff to the side. Listen, the crew up here is kind of an interesting bunch. A lot of these people have been here since Colorado was still a territory. He grinned and looked at Jeff thoughtfully. Some can come off as a little abrasive, but just give them a chance. CO Grigo looked up from checking Whisper's bag in the entranceway and saw Jeff talking with the captain in the parking lot. He handed him his bag back and squinted. Hey, Whispers, that's not Rich out there, is it? No, it's his replacement. I forget his name. Kramer, Sergeant Espinosa exclaimed. Yeah, that's it. Grigo couldn't help but notice the similarities between the two men. The shadow cast by the perimeter lights only added to it. He laughed. <laughs> Maybe it's just the G.I. Joe haircut. Jeff walked into the break room and up to a large office with a leather couch and a giant palm cactus. Is this my office? He asked Carlson, who followed behind him. No, that's my office. Yours is further down the hallway. Carlson led Jeff to a much smaller room next to the bathrooms. This is yours. It was originally a porter closet that was converted into an office. As soon as the new fiscal year comes around, we'll try to get you some different furniture in here. Carlson smiled. Well, I'll let you settle in. I'll be back for the noon count. Count time. Count time. The message came over the intercom and Jeff walked with the captain over to the control center. Espinosa stared at him and sipped on a glass of iced tea while he waited for the count sheets to come in. The porters cleaned while they waited for the count to clear. Inmate John Yellowhair was the office porter and also a trustee. A trustee was a prison term for inmates that had been down for many years and earned the respect and trust of staff. He spoke with whispers inside the unit office. How's the new lieutenant? Yellowhair asked. I don't know. He just got up here. 
He continued mopping and looking down towards the floor. Suddenly, he stopped and looked up at Whispers with a serious look on his face. You know I'm not one to bullshit you, boss. Whispers nodded. In Native American culture, we are a very spiritual people. We believe that we all carry with us an aura. It is who we are. And like all people, some is good, some is bad, and some is in the middle. Yellowhair looked over his shoulder. When your lieutenant got up here and I took one look at him, I saw something that I've never seen before in my life. Whisper's eyes were fixed on Yellowhair. What did you see? His aura was dark and uh, not his own. Whispers laughed and leaned back in his chair. What exactly have you guys been smoking out there in the sweat lodge? Yellowhair sighed. Listen, I know it sounds crazy, but a long time ago my granddad told me a story of a man on our reservation that uh, opened himself up to negative energies. He said his aura was black and gray. It wasn't his own, but it tried to portray itself as if it was. He had the ability or sense to see into a man's soul. Whispers leaned up in his chair and a smile had drained from his face. So you're telling me that this new guy is possessed or something? I've had these visions since I was a boy. At first I didn't know what it was. It kind of frightened me. It wasn't until later that I learned I shared the same gift as my granddad. He sighed heavily. I don't know for sure if your lieutenant is possessed, but there's something that I've never seen before. Something ugly that is surrounding him. While turning in keys after work, Whispers turned to Sergeant Espinoza. Inmate Yellowhair thinks that the new lieutenant is possessed. Espinoza laughed. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. I laughed at first, too. I don't know, does Kramer come off as a little strange to you? You know what, Whispers? That fucker stood in the corner almost the whole time while he was in the control center. The same way that Rich would. Hell, in the same spot. Espinosa crossed his arms. You gotta quit listening to inmates, though. Yellow hair is a drug addict and a thief that's been in and out of the system since Juvie. Several days had passed and Jeff was walking through Charlie Wing. He walked very slowly, carefully examining each cell. He finally stopped in front of Charlie 36. He looked inside the window and saw Yellowhair laying down watching his television. Yard, come to C-36, he called out over the radio. Whispers showed up wearing his fingerless gloves and reaching for his cuffs. What's up, LT? I want you to strip this one out and shake his room down. And I don't mean pick up his trash and leave a mint on his pillow. I mean dump his shit into a little pile in the middle of the floor. Jeff walked away briskly. When Whispers looked in and saw it was yellow hair, he reluctantly opened his door. The lieutenant wants you stripped out and your room shook down. Yellow hair peeled off his headphones and turned to him. What's this concerning? I don't know. Whispers tried to be stern. But the LT wants it done, so get your shirt on and follow me to the restroom. After he was finished, Whispers knocked on Jeff's door. I stripped him and checked every inch of that cell for contraband. The only thing I found was some extra laundry ties and a few scrub pads. He paused as he peeled off his gloves. Well, what was that about? I got a snitch guy claiming that yellow hair might be bringing in drugs. Jeff turned to his computer and then turned back. Also, check the sweat lodge. They could be hiding it in their pile of shit out there. At lunch, yellow hair walked slowly through the chow line. Espinoza stood by the window monitoring the inmates. As Yellowhair passed by, he nervously looked up from his tray. Hey, Sarge. After lunch, can I get a minute of your time? He met Yellowhair in the hallway after he finished eating. Look, you know I'm not one to stir up shit. I keep to myself. I know how to do time. 
Espinosa stood with his arms crossed and nodded. I know why your lieutenant is bringing heat on me. The shakedowns, the strip outs. I know it isn't just a coincidence. So then what is it? Yellowhair clutched his medicine bag. Ever since I talked with Whispers the other day, Kramer's been on my ass. Espinosa had an unconcerned look on his face. All I know is, I'm almost out of here and I don't need anyone messing that up for me, okay? Jeff heard Mallory's truck pull into his driveway. Axel, her dog, jumped out and followed her up the porch steps. As Jeff opened the door, she hugged him and then pulled away to get a glimpse of his new look. Her smile slightly faded. What's wrong? You just look so... different. Where did all your hair go? And no glasses? Did you get contacts? Axel, who usually ran to Jeff, stood behind Mallory. The hair on the back of his neck stood up and he began to snarl and bark. Jeff looked at the dog. What's wrong with him? He then placed his hands on Mallory's shoulders. I don't know any good barber shops up here, so I decided to cut my own hair. One on the side and four on the top. He made a shearing motion with his hand. And my glasses started giving me headaches, so I ditched them. Well, you better get into an eye doctor. Can you see it all? I see fine. Jeff's tone became more agitated. Already bitching. Is that all you care about, my haircut or my glasses? No, Mallory said, startled. You look just a little different, but I'll get used to it. She grinned awkwardly. Jeff turned and walked inside. She made her way to the patio where she sat with her arms crossed. Jeff came up from behind her. Thirsty? She turned around quickly and saw Jeff hovering over her, holding a bottle of Bud Light. He twisted open the cap and handed it to her then sat down next to her. So, what do you think? Mallory looked around thoughtfully. It's just wonderful. It looks like you had the mountains in your backyard. Sometimes in the early morning I can watch the deer grazing in this back area. He pointed out into the distance. It's amazing how tame they are. Mallory smiled contentedly. As soon as I get a chance, I'm going to get a bow. When the season rolls around, I won't even have to get out of my boxes to kill the little bastards. Mallory got a puzzled look on her face. That's funny. I didn't know you hunted. Jeff smiled and pulled out his red Zippo lighter from his shirt pocket. There's a lot of things I didn't know about me either until I got up here. He then lit his cigarette and took a puff. Later that day, Mallory rummaged through the cabinets looking for a colander when she came across a pile of old photographs. She wiped her hands on her apron and then curiously shuffled through them. They looked to be family photos of the people that used to live in the house. She suddenly stopped and the corners of her eyes crinkled like paper mache as she studied one that caught her attention. It was a man standing in the living room. He had a large build and was wearing a black tank top. His hair was shaved into a crew cut and he had a mustache that extended just past the corners of his mouth. In his hand was a bottle of Bud Light. She turned and looked outside. Jeff was standing next to the barbecue grill, wearing a black tank top and holding his can of beer. With him no longer wearing glasses and his hair buzzed, the resemblance was uncanny. She could see him getting ready to come inside, so she quickly tossed the photos back into the cabinet, but slipped the one she was looking at into her back pocket. Some weeks later, after returning to her home in Cannon City, Mallory sipped coffee and tried to keep her composure while visiting her friend Janet. Janet looked intensely at Mallory as she studied her body language. What's wrong, Mal? You seem distant lately. Mallory sighed sat her coffee down and crossed her arms. I don't know. Something's off with Jeff. How so? This might sound strange, but his looks and personality have changed. Jeff was the sweetest guy, but lately he's become the biggest asshole. And there was this picture that I found up in his cabinet. She pulled out the photo that she took from Jeff's house and placed it on the coffee table. I know it might sound crazy, but I found this photo in one of the cabinets. This man, I don't know who he is, 
but he looks just like Jeff looks now. Janet looked down at the photo, then picked it up and squinted to get a better look. She got a surprised look on her face. That's Lieutenant Rich, the new guy who transferred from Meeker. Mallory had a puzzled look on her face. Wait, that's the guy Jeff's renting the house from? Later that evening, Mallory gathered up the courage to call Jeff. So what's the guy's name that you're renting the house from? Alan Rich. The guy who transferred to Cannon City, right? Do you know why he left Meeker? Yes. From what he told me, I think he was taking care of his father until he died. Or should I say blew his brains out in the bathroom. What? The old man next door told me. His father killed himself in here. I guess Rich must have forgotten to mention that to me when he was telling me about this place's colorful history. I will say the crime scene cleanup crew did a pretty good job of cleaning up the mess. Of course, even the best tidying up can't always catch those stray remnants of skull matter that sometimes get left behind. Jeff smiled sadistically. Mallory's stomach turned as she began to realize that this wasn't Jeff on the other end of the phone. It may have sounded like his voice, but she knew this wasn't something that he would ever say to her in his right state of mind. Inmate Yellowhair decided the best policy would be to lay low and avoid Jeff at any cost, and the next few weeks at Meeker Correctional Center were pretty quiet. Jeff mainly kept to himself, and most of the staff just assumed he was a little odd. Sergeant Espinosa knocked on the window out of the control center and motioned to Whispers to come inside in a dramatic fashion. Check this out! He pointed at the new tool inventory sheet that hung on the wall next to all the equipment. Look how Kramer signed it! Whispers glanced at the sheet and saw the signature was signed, A. Rich. Is this the new sheet or the old one? Espinosa pointed at the date in the upper corner. It's the one that just came out this week. Why would he sign his name as A. Rich? Whisper said in his raspy voice. Espinosa just raised his eyebrow. Can I force him to get mental health treatment if he doesn't want to? Mallory asked Janet over the phone. So you think he went up there and lost his mind? Janet responded. How else do you explain someone's personality and looks completely changing? Is he drinking? Yeah. Bud Light? I've known the man for the last five years and he hates Bud Light until now. Janet snickered. Woman, if changing your favorite alcoholic beverage qualifies you for mental illness, I think I'd be certifiable at this point. I'm being serious, Janet. Listen, I went through a similar situation with Ron. He became distant, started keeping secrets, all that. As long as he hasn't cheated on you like Ron did to me, all the rest of that stuff can be worked out. And sometimes people just change. Janet sighed. Hell, maybe it's a midlife crisis or a male menopause. We get hot flashes and they take up bow hunting. Mallory sighed, overcome with emotion. Yeah, maybe so. Captain Carlson leaned into Jeff's office. Hey, Kramer, I have to ask you about something. I was checking the tool inventories and couldn't help but notice the signature on the pages. Carlson placed the papers on Jeff's desk. Jeff looked down at it. Carlson smirked. It's signed A. Rich. Lieutenant Rich left here a few months back. There's no way he was here to sign these. There was an uncomfortable silence between the two men, and Carlson chewed his gum nervously. Jeff had no expression on his face. I didn't sign those. Well, who did? Rich must have signed them before he left. Carlson stopped smiling and closed the door behind him. Also, a couple staff have told me that you've identified yourself as Rich when you've answered your phone. Jeff shrugged his shoulders. Well... Are they just making it up? Carlson asked sternly. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Those inventories are legal documents. Jeff interrupted. There's been a lot of accusations and finger pointing going on since I got here. And not just with me. Carlson got a serious look on his face. What do you mean? Jeff smiled. Inmates tell me things. I know what's going on with you and that housekeeping, Sergeant. 
taking her in the porter closet during count when you think no one notices. How long's that been going on? Does your wife know? Carlson scowled and pointed at Jeff. You don't know shit. Don't you ever bring my wife into this, got that? Jeff leaned back in his chair and put his hands behind his head. Cap, you don't know who you're dealing with. I didn't come here to make friends. He leaned back up slowly, and his eyes got real big. You ain't gonna run me off again. The sweat beaded on Carlson's forehead. You're right. I don't know you, but we're gonna get to know each other real quick. You think you can just transfer here, threaten me, and take over my prison? This ain't Cannon City. You have no idea how things work up here. Carlson turned to leave, then turned back to Jeff. We'll deal with this later. Mallory had been agonizing about how to approach Jeff over her concern for him. She decided to take a trip to see him with his brother Mark. I haven't spoken to Jeff in months, Mark said as he sat in the passenger seat of her pickup. You really haven't missed much. It's like talking to a stranger. Her hands nervously clutched the steering wheel. Mark looked out the window gloomily as the pine trees that lined the road rushed by. Jeff was chopping wood beside the house when they pulled up. Jeff! Mallory cried out. He continued splitting the logs as if he didn't hear her. Jeff! She yelled again. Jeff! Mark yelled as he walked closer to him. Jeff paused and turned around. Mallory ran up to give him a hug. The axe rested against her shoulder blade, just like in the nightmare Jeff had. What are you doing here? Jeff asked. Mallory swallowed heavily. Well, me and your brother just wanted to come check on you. We were concerned that we haven't heard from you in a while. Jeff walked up to the porch and sat down in his chair. He pulled a bandana from his pocket and swatted the mosquitoes. Mallory and Mark both sat next to him. I would have called more, but I've just been really busy up here with the new house and job. I can see that. What is it about this place? Mark asked. Jeff paused and looked up at the sky thoughtfully. Some people find places, and some places find people. This place found me. Mallory looked over at Mark with despair. Her eyes teared up and she had an emotional outburst. I don't know if you're trying to make me feel unwelcomed, or if you're just so damn caught up in yourself that you could care less about your family. Mark squirmed. It's been a long drive. Mind if I use your bathroom? First door on the left. Mark opened the screen door and made his way through the living room. There were two pictures hanging on the wall that caught his attention. Strangely, he didn't recognize any of the people. Jeff came up quietly from behind, startling Mark. She was beautiful, wasn't she? Jeff pointed to the picture of an older lady smiling next to who appeared to be her husband. Who is she? These are pictures of my family. Mark looked confused. Your family? This isn't our parents. What are you talking about, Jeff? She passed away on a Tuesday afternoon, Jeff sobbed. Some months later, Dad passed too. Blew his brains all over the bathroom wall. The same bathroom I showered in and brushed my teeth in since I was a kid. Jeff grew more and more frantic. <laughs> Do you know what that's like? Do you know what that does to a person to find his own father like that? Jeff, Mark pleaded. Get out. What? Get out of my house. Mark tried to rationalize with Jeff, but before he could say anything, Jeff began to strangle him. <sighs> Mallory burst into the house. What the hell are you doing? Jeff turned to her, tipping over the lamp and end table. His green eyes had turned an unholy black. Mark grabbed Mallory, and the two ran out of the house, got into her pickup, and sped off. That's not my brother, Mark said, still out of breath. When I looked into his eyes, they were black. Did you see that? Mallory nodded in disbelief. The two stayed silent most of the way home. Alan Rich grumbled to himself as he checked his calendar. It had been over two months since he received any rent money from Jeff and property taxes for the house were coming due. He dialed his number 
but like all the times before, it went straight to his voicemail. Rich decided to pay Jeff a visit and pulled up in his driveway in his Ford King Ranch. He put it in park, took off his sunglasses and looked around the property. The yard was well manicured. He knocked on the door and stood back and crossed his arms. The door slowly opened and Jeff answered. Can I help you? Yeah, you can help me. You're two months late on your rent and you don't answer your phone. I had to drive all the way up here, Rich barked. Excuse me? Jeff replied. Rich raised his voice. Sorry if I was unclear. Let me rephrase that. You're two months late on your rent. I need the money. Just who in the hell do you think you are? Rich rolled his eyes. Listen, asshole, I'm the landlord. Just who in the hell do you think you are? I'm Alan Rich. I own this property. Rich's eyes got real big. Are you fucking with me? Are you crazy or something? Jeff reached behind the door and pulled out his crossbow. He pointed it at Rich and pulled the trigger. The arrow struck him in his trachea. He stumbled back, trying to keep his balance as he inched closer to the edge of the porch. He took his hands and grabbed the arrow, pulling it out only a few inches before tripping backwards down the steps. Rich laid there, gasping for air, with the arrow sticking out of his neck. A pool of blood began to form on the sidewalk under his body as the life slowly drained from his eyes. Glenn Spurlock was watering some plants in his yard when he heard the commotion. He dropped the hose and adjusted his glasses as he looked through the slats in the fence. Good God almighty, he said to himself. He ran inside his house almost tripping over his own feet and called the police. Jeff calmly put the crossbow down and walked out to where Rich laid. He grabbed his feet and drug his body up the steps and into the house. A short time later, a patrol car sped into the driveway. There was a smeared blood trail on the sidewalk that led into the house. A look of concern came over Deputy Arnold's face. Get your double barrel ready, Sheriff Houston said to him. Dispatch, this is Yukon 1. Get all available units to 1127 Golden Oak, possible Code 9. The two exited their squad car with their weapons drawn and ran up to the front of the house. Houston motioned to Arnold to go around back. He then proceeded cautiously to the front door. He knocked and announced himself. This is Meeker County Sheriff's Department. I need you to discard any weapons that you may have and peacefully exit the house with your hands up. Arnold led himself through the back gate, gripping his shotgun so tight his fingers began to cramp. He looked in the living room window and saw Rich's body on the floor, with the arrow still in his neck. He slammed his back up against the house and took a deep breath. Yukon 1, this is Yukon 4. I got visual on a wounded male victim inside the house. Possibly deceased. Roger that, Houston responded. He raised his voice and announced himself again. I repeat, this is the Meeker County Sheriff's Department. I need you to discard any weapons that you may have and peacefully exit the residence with your hands up. If you fail to do so, we will be forced to come in and get you. Arnold turned to look back in the window. Suddenly he froze. He could hear the faint sound of music coming from inside the house. Houston came around the side and startled him. Arnold jumped and stumbled backwards. Jesus, man, you scared the crap out of me. No one's opening up. I think we can gain access through the window on the east side of the house. Listen, Arnold exclaimed. You hear that music? Houston looked inside the window and saw Rich's body. He then put his ear to the glass and listened. There could be someone inside, or it could be a diversion. He motioned to Arnold to follow him to the side of the house. Houston took his baton out of his holster and broke out the window. He dragged it around the edges, carefully clearing away the jagged bits of glass. He then climbed through while Arnold followed close behind. Houston's eyes scanned the inside of the house. It was in disarray like it had been ransacked by a madman. Both men kept their weapons drawn. Houston pointed to the living room. They walked over to Rich's blood-soaked body. Arnold kicked his side, then knelt down and checked his pulse. 
He looked up at Houston. He's dead. They continued walking into the pantry that led into the garage. The music got louder. As they got to the door, Houston turned to Arnold and nodded. Arnold raised his shotgun. Houston crouched down and aimed his pistol, then swung open the door. Inside the garage, Jeff sat alone with his back to the two men. He stared motionless at the record player as it belted out the old blues song. Show me your hands, Houston shouted. Jeff sat unresponsive with his hands in his lap. Show us your damn hands, Arnold hollered over the music. The two men couldn't see that Jeff's eyes were blacked out. They slowly walked down the steps, keeping their aim. Houston sensed something wasn't right. He quietly whispered under his breath, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He carefully holstered his pistol and grabbed his taser. This is your last chance to put your hands in the air and end this peacefully. After a few moments, Houston pulled the trigger and hit Jeff in the back of his neck with his taser. Jeff scowled menacingly and got up out of his chair, ripping the probes out of his <laughs> neck. Houston got a surprised look on his face and fumbled for his pistol. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Arnold strike Jeff in the head with the buttstock of his shotgun. Jeff fell to the garage floor. Houston drove his knee in the small of his back and cuffed him from behind. The record player stopped spinning, causing the music to slow to a drawn-out stop. Dispatch, this is Yukon 1. I got one in custody. Outside, a barrage of police vehicles lined the street. Houston smirked at Arnold. Perfect timing. He placed Jeff in the back of his squad car and closed the door. He turned to Arnold. Did you happen to get a good look at this asshole's face when he turned around? Arnold thought about it for a minute. Not really, but my 12 iron sure did. He chuckled obnoxiously. Houston looked down at the ground and rubbed his face. I think I've been doing this line of work way too long, kid, because I swear to you, that man had no eyes when he looked at me. Arnold's smile disappeared. What do you mean he had no eyes? He looked at Jeff in the squad car. Hey, he looks like he has a set of eyeballs to me. Listen, don't say anything. If that gets up to headquarters, I'll be filing paperwork behind some desk somewhere. Down at the Meeker County Detention Center, Jeff sat alone in his cell under observation. A psychiatrist assigned to his case spoke with Sheriff Houston in his office. Well, in layman's terms, I don't believe that he's faking it. He believes in his mind that he's this man Alan Rich that he murdered. When I asked him about Jeff Kramer, he appears confused. I see, Houston replied, crossing his arms. It's a severe case of a delusional disorder. Sir, does your profession... He cleared his throat nervously. <clears throat> uh, recognize demonic possession? Are you asking me personally or professionally? Layman's terms, Houston said. The psychiatrist smiled warmly. Sheriff, I'm a Catholic, but I'm not clergy. You'd have to get a hold of the church to get an answer on that matter. Deputy Wallace was making rounds in the jail that evening when Jeff called out to him. Deputy. Excuse me, deputy. Yeah, Wallace answered. Would it be possible to get a little music in here? It's so quiet. Wallace thought about it for a minute and looked over at his office radio, which was next to Jeff's cell. That might be a possibility. You've been fairly well behaved. Maybe some blues? Jeff smiled devilishly. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.